settings to and capacity limits removed. Infection control epidemiologist Colin Furness tells the Toronto Star, if the goal were to create a wave as large as possible, then we've made all the right decisions. Another signal that the sixth wave is here is COVID-19 hospitalizations are on the rise, with nearly 800 people in hospital with the virus compared to about 600 a week ago. Dr. Michael Warner, director of critical care at Michael Guerin Hospital, says now is the time to put masks back on and for there to be a ramp up of third and fourth shots and an increased push to get kids aged 5 to 11 vaccinated. Laura Carney, City News. City News time 9.01 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. It's a mild finish to the month of March. We'll climb to 14 for the high today with some wet weather at times. Chance of an isolated thunderstorm as well and a gusty wind out of the south. Tonight a few showers ending late this evening then partly cloudy overnight the low three. For today the high 14. And right now in Ottawa, it's zero. In Smith Falls, it's one degree. City News Time 902. Stats Canada says a real gross domestic product grew by 0.2% in January. It was a month marked, though, by restrictions due to a surge in COVID-19 cases. Goods producing industries drove gains in January, the agency noted. The construction sector, for example, grew for the third time in four months. The largest monthly gain was in wholesale trade since July of 2020. 20, but the same could not be said for the service sector. As a whole, it registered zero growth in January. Accommodation and food services, the arts, entertainment, recreation sector all saw their largest monthly decline since wave one of the COVID pandemic in April of 2020. The agency also says its initial estimate suggests the economy grew, though, 0.8% in February. StatsCam will release those figures coming up at the end of April. Britain's defense ministry has confirmed that Russia is continuing to pound northern Ukrainian cities. British authorities have said that significant Russian shelling and missile strikes have continued in the northern Ukrainian city. The aggression continues despite Russia's assurance that it would de-escalate operations in Chernihiv and near Kiev. Britain's Ministry of Defense reported that Russia still held positions to the east and west of Kiev, despite the withdrawal of a limited number of units. It believes that heavy fighting will likely take place in the suburbs of the capital in coming days. I'm Karen Chamas. City News Time 903. Your transit fare will be going up May 1st if Council approves a Transit Commission motion. On May 1st, the adult monthly pass will go up three bucks to $125.50 a month. A single trip will also increase. It will now cost $370 on May 1st. Transit Commission also heard about ridership levels. The budget this year was based on ridership being 80% of the pre pandemic level. The ridership level is actually at 45%. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's got the news and the views. He's got views on the news. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Now the carbon tax goes up tomorrow. Carbon tax goes up tomorrow. I mention that only because I was looking at the New York Times website this morning, the New York Times. Story there about Joe Biden, president of the United States, Democrat, okay, liberal. And this afternoon he is going to announce more oil will be released from the United States Strategic Petroleum Reserve because he is worried about Gas prices, gas prices hurting the working class of America. The average gas price in the United States is $4.22 U.S. a gallon. And the Internet tells me that's the equivalent to $1.42 Canadian a liter. $1.42, $1.42, and Joe Biden's worried. More headlines from the New York Times this morning. Liberal newspaper, okay, the most liberal of newspapers. Soaring costs of diesel ripples through the economy. Farmers spending more to keep tractors and combines running. Shipping and trucking companies passing higher costs on to retailers. And this one, and this one. New York State weighs gas tax holiday. Gas tax holiday. New York State, quote, New York Times reports, there are few things 
that New York State lawmakers seem to agree on. One of them is gas prices are too high. New York, a very, very blue state, a very liberal state. Average gas price there, four thirty-two a gallon, but a dollar forty-five Canadian, a liter. And you have politicians, liberal politicians, twisting themselves into knots because they are hearing it from voters. Gas prices are too high. You have to do something about gas prices. Here in this country, nah, nobody cares. Well, the prime minister doesn't seem to care. He's going to raise the carbon tax tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Trudeau. Thank you for your compassion. Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show on City News. Great show ahead for you. Boy, there's a lot to talk about. Coming right up, the latest on COVID-19 here in Ottawa. Sixth wave, the sixth wave. Dr. Doug Manuel, epidemiologist, senior scientist, Ottawa Hospital on the rising COVID cases in our community, prompted a note from the chief medical officer of health for the city of Ottawa, Dr. Vera Etches. He's written to the province expressing her concern about the level of virus in the community, encouraging everyone to keep masking up. So we'll talk about this to get our show started this morning. I spoke with Dr. Manuel just, a, gosh, just a few weeks ago when most of the restrictions were being lifted, like the mask mandate. And at that time, I mean, Dr. Manuel was sounding very... Upbeat, I have to say. He was quite pleased. Really, for the first time in two years, he wasn't worried when I when I spoke to him on the phone. He sounded quite optimistic with where things stood. That the worst appeared to be over. That that we were in pretty good shape here in the Ottawa area. How does he feel today? Well, I spoke with him this morning and um, he's I wouldn't say he's pulling the fire alarm or anything, but he's not nearly as bubbly as he was just a few weeks ago. So that's coming right up as well this morning. Boy, it's all political now. Now you get to mix the sixth wave of the pandemic with politics, provincial politics especially. In October, they have the Quebec election. And in Ontario, the election is just a couple of months away. And this is all over the news now. Sixth wave, sixth wave, sixth wave. Sixth wave is here. The sixth wave is here. But you know what else is almost here is the election campaign in Ontario. I mean, what are we? Probably just a few weeks, a month at the most, probably from the writ drop and the the official campaign starting. Doug Ford already has his campaign music, you know. Get it done, get it done. Get what done? The sixth wave? On to the seventh. No. So if you're Premier Doug Ford, you have, you know, you have rising cases of COVID-19, which is bound to result in higher hospitalizations, more people getting sick, more people missing work. I mean, what do you do? What do you do? Would this premier really reimpose public health restrictions two months before an election and re-election on the line? I mean, wouldn't that be an admission of failure? Or would that be a sign of true leadership? I said, your health is my number one concern, and I mean it. And even if it costs me the election, we can't have rising case counts and rising hospitalizations. I don't know. I don't know. What should his political opponents be doing? So close to the election campaign. What, how would it look for them if they called for lockdown type measures? Gosh, anything to do with public health restrictions right now? It's just totally conflicting with provincial politics. There's no separating politics and public health, if there ever was. So we're going to get into that with our strategists this morning, Andrew Brander, Lindsay Maskell, here every week for a conversation that we like to call Ontario Politics This Week, and that's right after the 9.30 news. Also, 
on the provincial beat, but it also has a, a local angle here. Steve Clark is the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And I spoke to him this morning. We're going to talk about a couple of local issues. Okay, first of all, you have housing affordability. All right, housing affordability crisis. Now, Mr. Clark, as minister, formed a task force. You may remember it issued a report. That report made many recommendations, I mean, dozens of them, 55 recommendations in all, and some of them were not met with any kind of enthusiasm at the municipal level here in Ottawa. There was tremendous concern about a loss of local control in the municipal planning process. So now, just two months before Election Day, there's new legislation from the Ford government that it once again hopes will help alleviate the housing affordability crisis. And again, it focuses on supply, trying to get municipal building applications through the process faster, build more homes, build them faster, you know, kind of like get it done. So we're going to talk about that with the minister. And as well, another very important issue that I know the minister spent a lot of time on, and that's what is going to happen to some of the land that used to be the home of the Kempville Agricultural College that was closed? Shame. Shame still on the previous Wynn government for doing that. Closed the Kempville Agricultural College. And a lot of people were very upset about that, that they closed that agricultural college where generations of Eastern Ontario farmers were educated. So now there's a plan for some of that land to be turned into a new jail. I have always thought, we need a new jail. The one we have is too old, it's too overcrowded, it's time to build a new jail. And there are now there are plans for a new jail. And some people don't like that idea. Hey, do you want to live next to the new jail? But there's an op-ed in the newspaper today from an agri-scientist. They don't want the uh, farmland to be used to uh, build a new jail. Op-ed in the Ottawa Citizen this morning. So all of that is happening in Steve Clark's writing. He's very familiar with the file. So we're going to ask him about that as well. And we'll do the talk back hour. We do the talk back hour every morning on the Rob Snow Show between 10 and 11 o'clock. An hour of opinions, an hour of phone calls. Your opinions, your phone calls. I have a few opinions of my own. And today, COVID-19, the sixth wave. Sixth wave. It's here. It's here. All you have to do is listen to the news, right? Watch the news. Read the news. The sixth wave. It's here. It's happening. It was totally predictable. We opened too soon. We lifted the mask mandate too soon. Experts say. Experts say. What do you think should happen now? Since this is happening, the sixth wave, what should the government do? Should it do anything? Should it bring back the mask mandate? Make masks mandatory again? Bring back capacity limits? Bring those back. Dining rooms, 50% capacity, you know the whole thing. P- pandemic health-related restrictions. Should they make a comeback because of the sixth wave or is it time to move on we have to learn to live with COVID-19 take ownership of our own health personal responsibility self-management I hear things like that a lot the sixth wave it's here what should the government do that's our talk back hour question after the 10 o'clock news and this is the Rob Snow Show on City News Riding requires attention and focus. No distractions, no moment of unawareness, because one brief moment can cost a lifetime of other moments. Everyone deserves to arrive home.
The Maritime Provinces are home to some of the oldest settlements in Canadian history. But did you know that one of the first was actually started by black settlers? Take a minute to learn about the rise and untimely fall of Africville. Black people have lived in Nova Scotia since before the founding of Halifax in 1749, but it wasn't until after the American Revolution in the late 1700s and early 1800s that large groups of black settlers began to arrive in the province, many of whom were former slaves promised freedom and land in Nova Scotia. What they encountered when they arrived, however, was racist treatment by their white neighbors and government officials. This pushed many black people to build homes on the outskirts of town instead. But despite the area receiving little support from government officials and lacking necessities like functioning sewage systems, access to clean water, and proper garbage disposals, the tight-knit community persevered. And so Africville was born. For more than 150 years, the small community grew, expanding from just a few homes to a population of over 400 people. Everything changed, however, in 1964, when plans for a new bridge and the idea of urban renewal prompted the municipality to set its sights on Africville's land. Instead of investing in the community, officials approved a relocation program that promised free job training and employment assistance to help residents through relocation. But the reality wasn't so kind. Residents had their belongings moved in city dump trucks and homes were demolished immediately after their owners left. Of the 400 plus people living in Africville, only 14 residents held clear legal titles to their land, so the rest were only given $500 with the promise of more social aid in the future. Not much else was actually done to support Africville and its residents until 2001, when a United Nations report called for reparations to be paid to the community. In 2010, Halifax Mayor Peter Kelly apologized for the atrocities against Africville as part of a $4.5 million compensation deal. In 2021, Councillor Lindell Smith put forward a seven-part motion to plan for the future of Africville alongside local organizations and the descendants of former residents. Today, there's a public park and museum where Africville once stood, to teach visitors about the history of the land and its community. If you've never heard of Africville, you're not alone. The tragic story of this small black community in Nova Scotia is not as well known as it should be. The pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Let's get the very latest on COVID-19 here in our community as we welcome back Dr. Doug Manuel, senior scientist, Ottawa Hospital, epidemiologist, uh, family physician as well, a member of the science advisory team. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Medium. Okay. What is that? You know, mean? I think. Well, you know, Rob, I, I don't, I don't know if your listeners have listened every day, but last, I think we talked a week or two ago, and I was saying I was feeling great. You know, yes. a lot of weight off my shoulders, and um, there's a little bit more weight on my shoulders for sure. Uh, we're seeing um, a more rapid increase in our wastewater signal than than I had anticipated based on the models, and so we're uh, we're likely tracking a little bit higher than than the, than the modeling uh, based on the wastewater. We haven't seen cases go up, hospitalizations go up, and then we've seen in other cities in Canada wastewater going up in in other countries as well, a faster than sort of expected increase. Uh, in cases uh, from some of the modeling, so I'm, I'm, I'm still feeling you know pretty good. We're not going back to the last two years, but uh, we've got some headwinds for the next month or so. Are we in a sixth wave? You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of of the term wave, but I would you know yes, we are in a in a new wave. Okay, why do you say you're not a fan of that? Well, I, I always felt that wave sort of feels like it's out of our control. Um, but each wave, like this one, is is w well within our control, especially the degree of how high they go. So, uh, you know, this is this is largely within our making in the sense of how quickly we we open and how quickly we vaccinate. Uh, you know, BA two is is contributing to it, but uh, it really is. Um, you know, it's a product of, of how quickly we open more than anything. Okay, okay. Is any of this really a surprise? 
you know, mask, no, well, mask yeah. mandate ends. Most of the public health restrictions are, are, are gone. Capacity limits are gone for, for the most part. You still have to wear a mask in, uh, in a healthcare setting on public transit, but that's about it. Um, is any of this really a surprise that there would be an increase in, in cases? No, we, 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 we expected an increase all along. Like, uh, I think, he, you know, even Dr. You know, or Dr. Kieran Moore said, even when he introduced the opening, he said, this doesn't mean we're not going to see an increase. I think where, where, where we are is that we've always known it's difficult to estimate how high the increase is. I think we've always estimated or modeled that it's going to be lower than January or previous. But this is coming in, what my greatest concern is that it's coming in very quickly. So that steepness and um, that steepness um, indicate, uh, indicates that we're, we're increasing faster than the models have projected. So no, absolutely no surprise, but um, the, the speed that it's coming in and, and, and ultimately the height of the peak um, is uh, you know higher than than I think I expected when I talked with you two weeks ago, and I think what what you know the science table modeled a few weeks before that. Okay, how uh, difficult is it right now? to try and forecast trends, to try and do these models, just given the the lack of data, the lack of testing. Yeah, I was on the Ottawa Public Health's uh, dashboard this morning, and it says 800 cases in the last seven days and a rolling average of a little more than 100 a day. But, you know, really, what do any of these numbers mean? Uh, Are we in kind of like a fog right now? well, there's two parts that are foggy. I, I don't even look at cases, Rob. I look at wastewater and hospitalization and positivity. Um, positivity uh, for the province-wide is is almost vertical in terms of the increase. Um, hospitalizations have remained uh, quite flat, in fact, lower than, than I think I anticipated at this stage, but not at all. So, like it's going to go, it's going to go up, and wastewater is going up very quickly. And so, for sure, I don't pay attention to the cases. I, you know, I, I'd estimate we're we're more in the range of five thousand. If someone said ten thousand cases a day in Ottawa, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blink. Um, so we're, at, you know, other places around the world are seeing rates at one percent per day, uh, and um, and so one, you know, half a percent per day in Ottawa seems more reasonable to me. Um, and that we were going up, um, but so the fog for sure. But where we are, we're trying to connect wastewaters more clearly to cases and hospitalization. That work still ongoing around the world, not only here in Ottawa, uh, but around the world. Um, and then, but the second part is modeling, and the modeling is more complex. Um, you know, I kind of think of early in the pandemic, you know, these waves as we call, them, you know, come in with the winds blowing one direction and the waves are coming in consistently around the world. Um, we're all kind of going up and down at the same rate. Now, you know, there's wind one direction and current the other direction, meaning like, you know, um, and and the waves are all kind of popping up and down all over the place. The current is maybe the level of infection, past infection. And a, another wind direction might be um, the level of vaccination, but that's going to really be affected by even age groups. So the mo- there's many more things going in the models, and each one of these parameters has a lot of uncertainty around it. Uh, and 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 we see locations even in Ontario. You know, we're going up more quickly than in Toronto, uh, and so it's becoming more um, difficult to model as well. For me, it, it just takes me back to pandemic 101. You know, take things gradually when you open open slowly wait see what happens open further and we've we've gone pretty quickly so uh so that means that we're going to have uh these waves are going to be higher than they could be if we taken things slower okay okay so um obviously case numbers many multiples higher than whatever the official number happens to be and you say you're not really paying much attention to cases but rather wastewater and hospitalizations as for hop hospitalizations i was looking at that this morning um it's about 10 people in the hospital because of covid19 Another 30 people in the hospital with COVID-19, but not because of COVID-19, but nevertheless, about 40 people in the hospital and a handful, I think five or less in ICU. And only and only two of those are because of COVID-19. The, the balance 
happen to have COVID-19, but that's not why they're in the hospital. So how worried are you about the hosp- what's happening with the hospitalizations? Dr. Etches said yesterday she's concerned about that because hospitalizations are a lagging indicator. What, what, what do you say? Hospitals are going to go up, absolutely no question. The, the, the comforting thing is that we're starting off much lower than other jurisdictions. You know, I look at jurisdictions that for a million people, like roughly the size of Ottawa, they're at 200, 300. Many, quite a few jurisdictions like that are compared, like comparators like Denmark. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a potential to go quite a bit higher, um, but we're starting off a lot, a lot lower. Are we going to get into triple digits, like over 100? You know, the, that's, that's um, feeling pretty high to me, but it's possible um, based on what we're seeing in other jurisdictions. But that's getting back to January numbers, and, and I haven't heard anyone really talking about getting back to January numbers. But, but you know, I think of, as well, it's the number of, um, of with not um, or number with not from, you know, as cases go up, there's going to be more and more people in the hospital with COVID as well. That slows things down. And I'm, I'm more concerned today about absentee rates. So we're going to have a lot of people off work. We do it right now. It's going to go up. Yeah. So yep. are we going to have difficulties staffing our emergency services, nurses, police, fire, grocery store? Uh, and I think you're seeing um, businesses, some businesses, having difficulties managing um, managing um, any you know any business uh, when you have 10 or 20 percent of your your staff off. So that's con- that's concern. It's concern for our healthcare system for sure. All right. So what's your advice? Well, I, I, I this is I, I would follow everything Ottawa Public Health is saying. I, you know, I I'm definitely wearing my mask. Uh, uh, everywhere, um, no, not outdoors, but anywhere inside, um, and you know it's voluntary now, so uh, so it's up to us. But you know, I, I encouraged. I when I go to the grocery store, I don't go too often, but uh, or I was in the National Art Gallery on on the weekend. I'm, I'm kind of moving. I'm not going out as much now, but when I was there, almost everyone was wearing a mask, and there wasn't that many people there. So I think it's up to us now. Uh, it would be good if we can slow this down. Definitely recommend getting any vaccine that's available to you. So if you're at two and you're eligible for three, do that. If you're three and eligible for four, do that. I uh, would do that soon um, because uh, you want that shot and then you want it to um, have it be in you for a week or two so that you can get your antibodies going. So, um, so yeah, that would be the main advice right now. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Doug Manuel. My pleasure. That's good. Bye-bye.
News in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Thursday, March 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's one degree. And here's what's making news this hour. COVID cases on the rise. Indicators like wastewater on the rise. A local epidemiologist, Dr. Doug Manuel, telling the Rob Snow Show this morning, there is more weight on his shoulders now than there was two weeks ago. He says based on wastewater cases on the rise, so far that has not translated to case numbers and hospitalization. But Manuel says, while not a fan of the term, we are in a sixth wave of COVID-19. Ottawa police say the number of impaired driving charges is back to pre-pandemic levels. 146 people have been charged with that offence between January 1st and yesterday. 54 in March alone. That compares with 43 in March of last year. Almost half the people charged this year were involved in collisions. StatsCan says the economy only grew by 0.2% in January, mainly due to the COVID-19 restrictions. The service sector had zero growth. That was a lot better than those that declined, including arts, recreation, entertainment, hotel and food service. Indigenous delegates emotional as they walked out of a two hour long meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican today. The meeting went an hour longer than expected. Chief Gerald Antoine hopes it will forge the beginning of an important relationship, saying there is hope now for change despite the delegates collective grief and pain. City News Time 932. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Returns with Ontario Politics this week featuring Lindsay Maskell, Liberal Strategist, former advisor to Premier McGinty. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. And Andrew Brander, Vice President Crestview Strategy, former advisor to the Ford government. Good morning. Hey there, Rob. I understand you two met in person. Is that right? Yes. That was cool. Yeah, that was cool. For the first time. <laughs> At a very... Uh, At a liberal very event. event. <laughs> At a liberal event. What are you doing, Andrew? Are you spying on? You're spying on? It was much, much less exciting than grabbing uh, grabbing some long overdue patio drinks. Oh, um, I see. <laughs> okay. I will say All one right. of the... Uh, I like to call it a silver lining of, uh, of COVID is you're unexpectedly having to fill in for your colleagues uh, from time to time at, uh, things that you never thought you would go to. So right. There you right, go. Right. Doing a little opposition research there. Andrew, <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. All right. Interesting. That's cool. We're going to talk about, uh, Del Duca's pitch to voters uh, about economic dignity, but that's coming up a little bit later. Health experts. And we just had one on the show, Dr. Doug Manuel from the Ottawa hospital. Uh, they say we're into a sixth wave now, a sixth wave. What could that mean for health policy from the Ford government, given that we're so close to the drop of the writ and the election campaign in Ontario? What do you think, Lindsay Maskell? Well, I am sure that they are very nervously watching, having seen that this is from, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is obviously a new variant. Uh, uh, the fact that we're no longer wearing masks, uh, the mask mandate being lifted and, uh, and you know, the safety measures that have uh, that have been pulled back. Now, the tough thing is, and for, for any political party, is people don't want the return of these things, right? People are, voters are definitely over COVID, even though it is very much alive in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so it, it's a bit of a dangerous play because the premier has been uh, aggressive in the past on closures. We had the longest lockdowns in Canada, most aggressive lockdowns in Canada. And it would also cause a problem to not respond in the appropriate way now. Uh, so I'm sure the premier is hoping this is going to be a very short sixth wave and does not... Uh, does not affect people's mobility heading into an election because people they're all the polling has showed were not happy with the response during the during the pandemic particularly related to 
uh, lockdowns and sort of the pragmatic measures that could have that could have been utilized. So I'm sure he is praying to not have to bring back any health measures, but I'm sure that uh, people are definitely feeling the feeling the effects this time. That it feels very similar to uh, for most to December and January when we were when we were first hit with Omicron. Okay, so Andrew, the strategy according to Lindsay, would be pray. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think that's, I mean, I, th- I think that's part of it. I think yeah. even even though we're, you know, obviously not, not testing as much, and, and quite frankly, you know, I, I'm a little bit relieved that, you know, we're not daily waking up to those reports that sort of just build people's anxiety. Um, I will say, obviously, anecdotally, um, as I as I just mentioned from yesterday, it, it, it seems that a lot of people um, who, you know, COVID has not caught up with um, has, have, have been getting it uh, more in, in recent days. So we are we are certainly seeing an increase in uh, in community spread, which is not inconsistent uh, with the Easter sort of time frame of, of year, the seasonality impacts that we've seen over the last two years, um, seeing new variants uh, emerge this time of year. Um, but to respond specifically to the question around um, more mass restriction, um, I, uh, I do think that this is the exact scenario that the premier has been laying the table uh, for. He he did say very clearly that uh, he is open to bringing those back if needed. Mm. But again, this is about um, what the premier has been saying, which is learning to live with COVID. And this is what it looks like. Um, it's, it's a focus uh, back on what we were trying to do at the beginning of the pandemic, which is keeping our hospital capacity available for those who need it. And if we look at where we are today um, in terms of ICU beds, um, there are more available uh, today than uh, even before the start of the pandemic um, because of obviously the investments that the government's made in, in opening new ones. Um, but, you know, that's all to say, you know, I think that that's where governments are at. And, and I do think also federally um, we, we see that the federal government's even coming on board with this approach, uh, dis- despite the fact that you know they said a lot of stuff during during the campaign. They came forward this past week with another two billion dollars to help provinces clear those surgical backlogs, to get back on track, and to get our hospitals uh, under control. So uh, the premier's certainly putting. Uh, I, I I would I would differ from saying the the strategy is prey i would say the premier is putting a lot of trust in people to make their own individual assessments yeah. on their own risk yeah. uh on 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 their risk to public health um and and to put that first uh and and we do that in in a lot of cases so uh this is truly the first time the government's actually asking citizens to do their part as opposed to telling them what to do okay then Lindsay, if you're Stephen Del Duca or Andrea Horvath, how do you play this? I mean, you're running around demanding uh, the reimposition of mask mandates and capacity limits. What, what do you say if you're an opposition uh, leader right now? No, I mean, you have to, we, we're, I mean, any, everybody is aware people want this to be over. COVID can be very alive to you. It is, you know, I am, uh, we currently have, uh, you know, just brought my dad home from weeks of waiting in the hospital for a procedure because of surgical backlog. He got COVID in hospital. And so they've sent him home to have to wait longer because they can't operate after having COVID uh, for about three weeks. And it is alive and well in our day-to-day lives. But I also know that people are people are very much over it and want to figure out how we how we find a path forward and live with it. I do think that we should be looking at uh, what is a threshold number to to bring back uh, mask mandates and things. But we have basically killed all testing in Ontario. Uh, so it doesn't. We don't really, other than measuring wastewater, don't have a good metric, right? So. Yeah. Uh, it would make sense for people to say, "Hey, these are the these are the thresholds 
uh, that we should look at or where community spread is happening to to make some of these decisions based on numbers and, and science. But we don't have appropriate testing now in Ontario to be able to do that. But I do think it is dangerously, polit- it's a dangerous political move to be the one calling for uh, for rollbacks on measures that people are just completely exhausted uh, yeah. from over the last two years. Yeah, so it's, uh, we're between a bit of a rock and a hard place politically. Yeah, politically. Yeah, yeah. It just makes me wonder, Andrew, if, if you know, things like mask mandates, capacity limits, any of those public health restrictions that have been in place before, if all of that now is just off limits from a political point of view because we are so close to the election. What do you well, think? Well, they're, uh, they're not. And, and, okay. and the premier, right. and the premier um, has, has said as much, right? Yeah. Um, oh. He said, I think the quote was, you know, God willing, we don't have to bring those back, but I, I will if, if we so need there to. is quite. And, <laughs> and to, well, I mean, to Lindsay, Lindsay, to your point there, I mean, there are, there are some metrics um, and that most would argue are probably um, the the most vital in terms of uh, moving away from case numbers to uh, to the most serious cases and the, those who those who need the help and that and that is found in that ICU capacity number. Um, so uh, I mean the impacts of those obviously go greater to the point that that you were talking about um, and and the government. You know, certainly uh, expressed a keen interest both at the federal and provincial levels of, of clearing those backlogs. Um, but that's what it's always been about. It's always been about making sure that those who don't have COVID, um, you know, get access to the services that they need. Okay, let's move along. Done deal. Ford and Trudeau together again, along with just about every politician in Southern Ontario, as I could tell from that media event. <laughs> uh, the child care deal has been announced, eventually $10 a day. How do you expect this to play out during the election? What does Ford say? What do his opponents say? What do you think, Lindsay Maskell? Well, first of all, it's good news. We finally have it. Uh, the, um, you know, the unfortunate news is, and particularly with, uh, with the Conservatives' new campaign slogan of get it done, is, get it done. are we really going to get it done last? Is that our, we usually get it done work finally. Yeah. <laughs> get it done finally. Get it done last. Um, so there's, which does have some impacts, right? So uh, we have called for the payments to be retroactive. For those that were, were in and had this, signed the same deal first have already received their benefits right so families have already had uh had payments and received that first 50 percent reduction in year one so those that signed have uh have already seen those benefits um but i also think there's a, a couple of items that are are missing from this that politicians and uh, other parties can talk to obviously is the retroactive of uh, retroactive payment and also uh, the capacity, right? The infrastructure, and uh, and also making uh, the career of caring for children uh, uh, more lucrative and easier to access in terms of free tuition. So, uh, you'll have, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this file, but we are uh, nobody is going to say it's uh, it's a bad thing. It's a fantastic thing. It's finally signed. Uh, but it is also no different than what other provinces received. Okay. What do you think, Andrew? Well, I, I think it is different. Um, and, and I think, yes, there's agreement on uh, where we ended up um, at the speech yesterday. Um, you know, uh, the liberal leader gave a little bit of uh, props, might be a generous word, um, but to the government for, uh, for getting it done. Um, as I really like to say, uh, but uh, to Lindsay's point, uh, the Liberal leader obviously is going to take take issue with the process here, and I think um, you're going to see uh, the contrast uh, around that. And I think that's something that the Tories shouldn't uh, shouldn't shy away from. Uh, to to the point that you already raised, uh, you know, the Tories just this past weekend, 48 hours before announcing the deal, launched. 
uh, their their new campaign theme. Um, it will, I'm sure, uh, be uh, devastating news for both you, Rob and Lindsay, that the For the People anthem has uh, <laughs> has unfortunately been retired. Um, but uh, but on on this theme of getting it done. Um, you know, they've, they've already started to sort of weave in that message of, you know, we are the ones that, that get these things done. Uh, and, and it's not the same deal. Uh, it's, it's $3 billion more, uh, which is a $3 billion better deal for Ontario. Um, and while the Liberals and the NDP were jumping at the first offer, uh, the Premier said, no, that's not good enough. Um, and, uh, you know, he fought uh, to, uh, to lead for, for better outcomes for taxpayers. Okay. When we come back, he calls it economic dignity. We'll talk about the pitch from the Liberal leader, Stephen Del Duca. This is Ontario Politics This Week on the Rob Snow Show on City News. <laughs> So the Women's Business Network is um, a volunteer-run association that achieves its uh, its uh, strategy and vision by supporting women to achieve their success on their own terms by providing development opportunities, valuable connections within the organization itself, and it, it facilitates member access um, to growth within their business and careers. I mentioned the absence, the two-year absence of the uh, Business Woman of the Year Awards. Uh, you know, obviously difficult, Mira, but certainly an opportunity to, to work on some new things. Tell us what, what, you've, what you've got planned, what you worked on. Yeah, we really missed putting on the BYAs uh, for the last two years because of COVID. It, it also was unfortunate that we couldn't celebrate the women that were having such a huge impact on our um, community in Ottawa. So we're really glad that they're back now. Um, as you know, that they've been around since 1983. Mm -hmm. They are uh, a purpose to celebrate the achievements, the professional expertise, and the leadership of all of the outstanding women we have in the National Capital Region. And for the first time this year in 2022, we've introduced two new categories, one being the Lifetime Achievement Award and the other one being the, uh, the Community Champion Award. Okay, yeah, and let, let's break it down even further because, uh, as I mentioned, there's a there, there's different categories, and then of course different awards within categories. Uh, tell us about some of the returning categories and some of the other awards as well. So the two returning categories that we're bringing back are actually the entrepreneur and the enterprise leaders. Those are, are very popular in our community. They draw a, a significant amount of nominations um, and, and they do get a lot of attention because it's very common um, that we take the opportunity that we want to celebrate the entrepreneurs in our community, especially after the two years yeah. of being through what they've been through. Okay. Right. So we're, we're looking for nominees of, um, of owners who have significant impact on their businesses that have seen strong growth in the last little while. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did do to revamp this award was we dissected it into three subcategories based on the term that the individuals have been in business for. So you've got from startups that have been around for one to three years, then we've got the emerging entrepreneurs three to seven and the established entrepreneurs for seven years and above. So there's really going to be three cat three awards or three uh, winners um, within the entrepreneur category itself. And then we've got the Enterprise Leader Award that's also come back. And this is an opportunity for organizations to nominate individuals within their, um, well, their, their, their business uh, um, that display exceptional leadership attributes, positively impact the environment. Strong voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Ontario Politics This Week, Lindsay Maskell and Andrew Brander, our guests. Both of them were at an event yesterday. The headliner was Stephen Del Duca, the glassless Stephen Del Duca, I will point out. Lots of speculation about that. It was, uh, is that a style thing? Is it, well, you know, what's going on there? Laser so, eye surgery. He had laser eye surgery. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, his pitch is, right now, economic dignity. 
So what's involved there? Economic dig a swimming pool in every backyard. Uh, Lindsay, you just play. <laughs> no, okay, cheap shot. Uh, Stephen Del Duca pitches economic dignity. What's the pitch to voters on economic dignity, Lindsay Maskell? Well, it is uh, it is just one part. Obviously, this, the platform is not out yet. This was a theme of the speech, though, to kind of give uh, a bit of a taste of what that would mean uh, for Ontarians. Um, of course, we're is you know back talking about uh, people shouldn't just be talking about minimum wage. We're now also going to need to be talking about a living wage. So it would be a minimum wage increase, but then in uh, in out years looking at what is the cost of living in Ottawa? What is the cost of living in Toronto? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and finding that to make sure that people have uh, the fair wage that they should have, a living wage. Um, it will give 10 paid sick days to all workers, something that has uh, been a continued through seen through the pandemic and then also making sure that every worker is covered by uh, if you know for the amount of people that now that the economy being driven with uh, with people that you know start their own business or or gig work that they have access to a health and benefit plan and uh, and of course uh, you know celebrating entrepreneurs that start a business and that if you start a business in Ontario or have been running your own business in Ontario the last two years to give you a corporate tax break to set up a business or for those that have have uh, you know been most impacted through the pandemic okay. the, the, to set up a business you should be rewarded for that entrepreneurial spirit and driving the Canadian economy so those are just a few of the planks there's uh, there is more including how we build to a four-day work week we all learned how to work in a different way during the pandemic oh yeah uh, so what does a more flexible uh, work week look like okay the Interesting. Future of okay work. all right you were at this event Andrew what do you think of it yeah, I like, you know, I, I do like some of the policies, some of the ideas, uh, especially around the portable benefits uh, program that would sort of respond to the way our economy is evolving. Uh, really like the commitment uh, coming from the Liberals on uh, the elimination of corporate taxes uh, for small businesses that were, uh, that were hurt um, by the pandemic. Um, also really liked how the, uh, the Liberal leader tried to frame the speech um, and, and, you know, frame this plan around being uh, solutions for people. He told a great story of uh, how his mom came here and was afforded the opportunity to succeed. And, and talked about how, you know, those are going to be the people he's fighting for. My big question when I, when I sort of, you know, left the room, um, is, is that, is that really what people are looking for in this moment in time in terms of that being the leading question, um, that they're going to be voting on, uh, when, you know, when they head to the polls? And, and, uh, while I imagine there was a lot of polling that went into this before, before announcing this, mm-hmm. I don't get the sense that a, a majority of people out there feel like they don't have opportunity i i do think people feel times are tough i do think people feel um they're worried about falling behind they're worried about their pocketbook but i'm not sure fundamentally at the end of the day they they feel like they don't have the opportunity to succeed for example if the message is economic dignity uh, uh, what about housing affordability or what about the price of gas or the price of groceries did, you know did they did he touch on that for ex- the cost uh, of living or uh, no uh no? not okay. not not really um <laughs> I, I do think uh as, as lindsay said you know there's there's, there's more to come uh, maybe there's, on that there's more yeah. <laughs> there's more lindsay, to come, but more to would, come on that lindsay yeah there will be more to come, I believe, from everybody. Even yeah. I would say, even yesterday, with uh, Premier Ford having talked about housing policy, you know, it is uh, it's a very quickly changing landscape, and so people will, you know, we will probably see a lot of those platform planks. Actually, probably not until right in a, in the writ, right? If this for the the Ford government has to obviously put out a budget, and I'm sure we would see some in there, but and needing to be talking about it. But uh, there's a lot uh, there's a lot of work that goes into a platform and costing, 
uh, as well as needing to see what the state of the finances are at. So there's quite a, it's delaying the budget does cause a platform disadvantage to your okay. opposition. All right, all right. Is, uh, is one of the other items, but obviously it is a part of what people are talking about, about the way our economy is changing, how we, how we change, how we need to change with it, what we need to change. Uh, but affordability items are, are key to that for sure. It's alive as people are talking about gas prices, hydro prices, grocery prices, housing prices, uh, and the the type of uh, the type of it's all part of how what does Ontario what yeah. does our Ontario yeah. look yeah. like yeah. in yeah. terms yeah. of being yeah. an affordable place to live. But Rob, that's the, yeah, sure. I mean that's the risk there, right? Which is he had a platform yesterday, and the opposition leader is not given a lot of platform, but he was given one a pretty high profile build speech. Uh, that was live streamed, you know, to anyone that wanted to subscribe, um, and 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 like he had the opportunity to start talking about these things. So you you really, you know, when you're when you're 30 days out from uh, from a writ, uh, you really need to use these opportunities um, to to touch on on the things that you think people are going to be voting on um, in in 60 days from now. Sorry, Lindsay, did you want to respond there? Well, I do think the other piece is that, of course, a writ period that is a, a short writ period when people are paying attention. Unfortunately, a lot of people are still very, you know, uh, are still very much. They might not even know the elections on the way. No, it, it's, it has been and it, it feels a little like the federal election of people sort of radar that it, it, it's going to sneak up a bit on people. They uh, they are not looking at. So you also have to be careful for what what you put out when of making sure that it gets the optimal traction in a writ period of when voters are making a decision. They are not deciding today. Uh, we are putting uh, putting out uh, continued pieces of information that give some insight into where Stephen Del Duca is going. And part of that was also telling his story. That was also a bit of an introduction for people. It came with a three-part story about what shapes, uh, who shapes him and what shapes the way he's going to be thinking about leading. Okay. All right. uh, so there was the the getting the introduction element of this of, over a, over a storyline that is going to take us to 62 days from now. Right. Introductions, kind of like the theme for this week for Ontario politics this week. The rebrand. You 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 missed the. So you talked about the fact that he you know has has lost the glasses, but when he when he got up to give the speech, you know they took away the podium was getting ready for a real barn burner of a, of a, almost a <laughs> TED talk like atmosphere. I, I, I would say though, um, you know, the, the room felt pretty flat and I'm, I'm trying to be as, uh, as nonpartisan as, uh, as right. possible okay. here, but, but it was a town hall of, to be clear. Like of, it was an audience Q and a all right, town all right, hall. All right, all right. Gotta find a better way to connect. <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you two connected. I'm glad the three of us connected today. It was nice to meet. Yes. Yeah. We'll talk next week. Sound Thank good. You, Thank you. Lindsay Maskell, Andrew Brander, Ontario Politics This Week. The Talk Back Hour is right after the news. 750-1310. The sixth wave is here. What should we do? 750-1310. Rob Snow Show after the news. City News. stability that you can count on, the fans can count on, the players, the vendors, um, and I am very, very committed to making this team a success both on the ice and off the ice.
Ottawa is a very political city and it's not just political with the people in parliament. You got street politics, you got business politics, you got basketball politics. And if you don't know how to navigate the systems, you get left behind. I did. They thought I went crazy. They thought I was dead. I was. But it's never too late to heal, to rebuild, to reinvent yourself. Present. It's a new season of the new Fly Fisher on Rogers TV. March 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, some light rain. It's one degree, and here's what's making news this hour. A local epidemiologist says Ottawa is in its sixth wave of this COVID pandemic. City News reporter Chris Currys with the details from Dr. Doug Manuel. The senior scientist with the Ottawa Hospital says our wastewater signals are much higher than anticipated, and he's concerned. I'm still feeling you know, pretty good. We're not going back to the last two years, but uh, we've got some headwinds for the next month or so. He tells City News he's worried about absentee rates in essential services like fire, health care, and police, and we need to slow the spread of community transmission. Definitely recommend getting any vaccine that's available to you. So if you're at two and you're eligible for three, do that. If you're three and eligible for four, do that. I uh, would do that soon. Dr. Manuel doesn't much care for case counts, but says if someone told him Ottawa was at 10,000 a day, he wouldn't blink. Chris Curry's City News. City News time, 10.02, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. It's a mild finish to the month of March. We'll climb to 14 for the high today with some wet weather at times, chance of an isolated thunderstorm as well, and a gusty wind out of the south. Tonight, a few showers ending late this evening, then partly cloudy overnight, the low 3. For today, the high 14. And right now with some light rain, it's 1 degree in Ottawa and in Smith Falls. First Nations delegates say they're feeling hopeful after a two-hour meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican. Chief Gerald Antoine says the Assembly of First Nations, uh, they, uh, despite collective grief and pain, he says there is hope for change. This change will bring dignity, equality, trust, and an opportunity for this change to happen. Now, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit delegates will meet together with the Pope tomorrow. They're hoping Francis will commit to making an apology for the Roman Catholic Church's role in the residential school system in Canada. They're hoping for that. Uh, sometime this year. More than five weeks into the war in Ukraine, Russia claims to be scaling back the military operations in some parts of the country to promote some trust between the two sides as negotiations are set to resume tomorrow. Reporter M. Wynn says U.S. intelligence, though, is telling another story. The Pentagon says only about 20 percent of Russian forces around Kyiv are moving away from the capital, and they're apparently just repositioning. Russians continue to bombard the suburb of Irpin. ABC's James Longman is there. As you can hear, the war rages. And this, this is one of the areas that the Russians say they are now going to leave. But as you can hear, there are no signs of this war stopping. Now, meanwhile, the talks between Ukraine and Russia tomorrow will not be in person. They will be by video. City News Time 1004. Ottawa police say the number of impaired driving charges to start this year are right back to pre pandemic levels. 146 impaired charges lay between January 1st and yesterday. Police say almost half of these charges resulted from collisions. This month alone, there have been 54 impaired charges laid compared to 43 in the same month last year. Police say with more people preparing for cycling, walking, and e scooter riding season, they're concerned and remind you even a small amount of drugs or alcohol can impair your driving ability. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. 
Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. The sixth wave. It's here. So what should happen? What should we do? Should the government reimpose public health restrictions because of the sixth wave or do nothing and ride it out? What do you think? 750-1310, 750-1310, Let's get into it. The sixth wave, I suppose it was inevitable that uh, we would be doing another show about COVID-19, the pandemic, and another wave. And uh, look, here we are. And I guess today is that day. It's all over the news. I mean, it's leading our newscast, the sixth wave, the sixth wave, the sixth wave. Headlines abound. Global news headline, Canada headed towards sixth wave. Experts warn. CTV News, sixth wave was expected, experts say. CB24, nearly 800 COVID-19 patients in hospital. As doctor says, Ontario is in sixth wave. Toronto Star, we're heading into the storm. Always so gloomy at the Toronto Star. We're heading into the storm. Wastewater reading show Ontario entering sixth wave. Uh, CBC News. Quebec likely headed towards sixth wave, says public health director. Globe and Mail. Canada facing rising COVID-19 wave. As health restrictions ease. Ottawa citizen. Ottawa public health reaches out to province due to concerning COVID levels. So you get the idea, right? You get the idea. Lots of headlines. Restrictions have ended. Spring has sprung. The grass has riz. And so have the case counts. Welcome to the sixth wave. So what should we do about it? And what should happen now? What should happen now? 750 1310, 750 1310, 613 750 1310. Uh, James, downtown. Downtown, James, good morning. You're on morning, City Rob. News. Yeah, hi there. Morning, Rob. Hi. Uh, I'm of similar thought to uh, Dr. Manuel. Um, I work, I look at the hospital numbers very closely every day. Okay. Um, at Chio, there's one child in for COVID. Um, and their catchment area is, you know, all the way, you know, Cornwall, all the way to Timmins. So. I mean, there's more RSV and other viruses uh, patients at CHEO than the one that's in for uh, for COVID uh, right now. Okay. Um, so, you know, and uh, like you, the numbers you also said, like there's 46 patients in Ottawa hospitals. Not all those are Ottawa people. They're from Russell and, and uh, Renfrew, et cetera. Yeah. There's only two. Uh, the 46, there's only 16 in because of COVID, and there's only right. two in ICU and 14 other patients, right? So... I mean, it looks to me like the numbers are okay. We're like Chio is trying to get some uh, cancer, rightly so, trying to get cancer patients from uh, Ukraine to come to the hospital, et cetera, so they can, they seem to be able to handle this, right? So yeah. I think it's um, a lot of this uh, screaming about wave is, is teachers' unions, um, obviously the Liberal Party and the and the NDP party trying to make hay of it. Okay. Um, so. I don't, and also if they mandate it, the, 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 the problem is the wrong, the, probably the, the right, the wrong people are to have taken off their masks. It's the people that are anti, the, there's a high correlation between anti-vaxxer and anti-masker. So the people that probably shouldn't be too worried about getting a mild illness are still masking and the ones that, um, should be a bit more concerned because they didn't get vaccinated, uh, are going around with no masks. And even if it was mandated, they'd wear probably a, crappy mask or a fake mask, et cetera, right? So I think we should just ride it out. Um, it you know, it's very, it's very political right now. Like the liberals oh, were yes, asking yes. for kids to be uh, masked. And then I saw that picture with the 50 liberal candidates um, with not one of them being masked at, uh, I think that was last week, at, at the liberal uh, uh, big to-do in Toronto, et cetera, right? So, if, you know, they're, they're calling for kids to be mandatory masked, but they have 50, like 50 or 75 candidates unmasked altogether. So I would just say ride it out. Uh, keep a very close eye on the hospital numbers. The weather's 
eventually will get warmer, so the more windows open. We have Paxlovid, which is for treatments for yeah, yeah, that's just yeah. for unvaccinated people. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say ride it out, and uh, and uh, I obviously I, I personally wear a mask uh, most of the time indoors, um, and uh, we we'll, we'll we'll get through this wave. Okay, thank you, James. Thank you very much. Good to hear from day. you. Yeah, you too. Yep, Colin in Canada. Sixth wave yeah, is I- here. What should happen? Well, everyone predicted it. All the all the experts and the even even the Facebook experts uh, predicted the sixth wave. Right. They know it was coming. Uh, I think that we've done a good job of of upping our capacity to deal with it, both in hospitals and in the public health. So I think I think riding it out. I think that uh, if you're that concerned about contracting it because of comorbidities underlying conditions then you know conduct yourself accordingly but we we can't go back to uh I'm take the politics right out of it the economy and society mental health all that stuff we can't go back to lockdowns and restrictions um, I, I just think it'd be too hard on society and i don't think people would accept it yeah yeah i i think i think you're probably on the right track there colin thank you thank you okay a couple of lines there a couple of lines there, 750-1310, 750-1310, We are in a sixth wave, according to the health experts. So, well, you know, what should the government do? You see how we've seen how it's reacted in the past when we've had waves of COVID-19, mask mandates, capacity limits, these sorts of things. Uh, Rebecca, Carlton Place, good morning. You're on City News. Good morning. Hi. Um, hi. I completely agree with your last two callers. Okay. One, 100%. Um, I'm vaccinated and I've had COVID and I'm over it. My family's over it. Yeah. Um, uh, anybody I talk to has really suffered from the lockdowns, like really suffered. Okay. And uh, I don't think we can go back to that. I think there would be a mass revolt against the government. Absolutely. I think they need to stay out of health care at this point. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, then, you know, wear a mask or, or do whatever you have to do. But isolate, isolate, yeah, whatever. Yeah, like right. if you don't feel yeah. comfortable, take care of your own health and, and we'll take care of our own health, basically. Um, you know, like healthy people are not a, not a risk to other people. So I think the fear that has been just spread so like wildfire mm-hmm. the last two years needs to settle down. Okay. Um, we've always had flus and viruses and sure. so many things floating around. Like this is, I, I think we have this under control. And like I said, if you don't feel comfortable, then you know, like mask up or stay home or, but don't let the rest of us suffer anymore. Okay. That's, that's how I feel. Gotcha. Gotcha. Fair enough for Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. I, three callers in, uh, there's a, a theme developing here. Jamie in Ottawa, the sixth wave is here. What should happen, Jamie? Well, I'm again in agreement with the last three callers. I okay. called you during the second and third wave saying that at that time we had our focus strictly on case counts and everybody was freaking out about how many cases there were yep. when hospitalizations were fairly manageable for the most part. Yep. And at that time, we were also counting people with COVID in hospital as opposed to today where we count people because of COVID. Yes. So at this yep. very moment, in the Ottawa hospital, we have eight people in hospital because of COVID and we have zero people in ICU. Yet here we are at the beginning of an apparent sixth wave, which is based on strictly wastewater, which is not really that scientific. And a lot of people have said that it's not very accurate. So we're basing a lot of this right now just on wastewater because we don't have cases to go by. Well, yeah, uh, because the the testing regime is not what it was in the early days of the pandemic, right? Hard to get a test now, right? So... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And in the early days, you know, everything was based strictly on on cases and it was a lot of fear mongering because you know, you'd have 10,000 cases, 5,000 cases and people would be losing their minds, but yeah. you know, m- many of those cases were asymptomatic. Uh, many of those cases were not hospitalized. They were not in the ICU. We didn't require ventilators. Like all of that crazy stuff that happened early on in the in the first 3 and 4 waves. Um, really scared people and I'm getting tired of the, the fear constantly and you know we are at the sixth wave now we've dealt with this um, we're gonna get through it we're gonna be we'll get fine. through it like, just ride it on. out ride it out ride it out Absolutely. ride it out got you Jamie thank you thank you we'll be right back thank you. Uh, four callers all basically with the same 
message. No, no, no. <laughs> On mask mandates, capacity limits, any kind of like health restrictions, these sorts of things. Uh, I'd like your opinion, please. 750-1310, there's one line available for you. This is the Talk Back Hour, your hour. Want to hear from you on the Rob Snow Show on City News. That same old train that brought me here is going to carry me away again. to talk back on the rob snow show have your say and call now 613-750-1310 so the question is for this talk back hour what should officials do now that the sixth wave is here of covid19 anything nothing restrictions should they make a comeback or no <laughs> no on that let's ride it out which has been the prevailing opinion so far this morning, but the hour's not done yet. Fonzie in Ottawa. Fonzie. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, hi there. What do you think? I, I think I'm just the fifth person that doesn't agree with this, with the whole mass thing. Okay. And, okay. and I don't think it's going to go ahead because it's going to hurt uh, Mr. Ford's election too much. Yeah, that's a good point. Because in yeah. the last month, he, you know, he's been giving out a lot of money to the Ottawa Hospital and the, that battery thingy in Windsor and then the sticker removal. It all looks good on him. It all looks good on him. This is not the time for him to say to businesses to close down because it's not going to work in his favor. Yeah, I think you when, are uh, politically, you're, you're right on the money. There, when, think, when, yeah. when, when the whole pandemic started, if you remember this, Doug, Doug Ford, people were hoping that he would he would look like the future prime minister when the whole pandemic started but halfway through it he started his restriction was getting harder and harder now people then thought he was going to be a good prime minister anymore 
now now we're back to close to the election and as you can see the, the promises is doing the money that is given out it's a lot of it has to do with elections like me and you both know that oh sure yeah for sure and yeah, yeah. another right. question is is 100 years ago when we invented the uh, combustion engine did we ever thought that it was going to be a problem for the the the, um, the carbon well, 100 years ago, I don't think so, not 100 Probably years Probably not. Ago. So, so my second question is, those batteries that they're putting in the cars right now, yeah. which is a good thing, okay. are they thinking of 100 years from now that the, what, the, what the, it's going to create, the problem it's going to create? Are we facing that right now, or are we just going to wait in 100 okay. years? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, that's maybe a topic better f- suited for tomorrow's Talk Back Hour when it's the Friday Free For All, and you can call him. We can talk about... All the all the money that the Ford government is is putting into um, electric vehicle technology, including you know trying to you know helping attract this five billion dollar uh, investment from Stellantis, which is Chrysler and Windsor, but that that's a whole conversation for another day. Uh, we're not on to that today. We're talking COVID today, sixth wave. What should the government do? Richmond, Shannon, you're on City News. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess I'm of the unpopular opinion, but I think okay. that okay. I, I do think the mask mandates should be in place um, at least until the under five kids can be vaccinated. Okay. Um, I think in schools, kids were f- most of kid, the kids were fine wearing them. I think the, the decision to remove them at schools was completely politically motivated right. and they could have just held out to the end of the school year and then there wouldn't be this whole debate do we wear them you know a lot of teachers aren't wearing them now with working with kids who are too young to be vaccinated in kindergarten um and you know people have the mentality oh if you're vulnerable just stay home well vulnerable people would like to be able to go to the grocery store you know so i think if you're going to the grocery store store for 20 minutes it's not asking too much to put on a mask. I can see if you're working there for eight hours, you don't want to wear it all day. But, you know, these people that can't be bothered to just wear one for 20 minutes to protect someone else, I just think that mentality is selfish. Fair enough, Shannon. Thank you for sharing your opinion. <laughs> yep. Nope. Very good. Yeah, there's a lot of politics uh, going on. I'm with you right there. Uh, Elizabeth in Perth, you're on City News. How are you? I'm good, Elizabeth. Thank you for calling. The sixth wave is here. What do you want the government to do? I don't really need the government to do anything. I just need people to have common sense. Okay. I don't know that you can hear it, but I have probably COVID or I have some sort of cold or whatever is floating around in the world. And common sense would dictate you put your mask on when you're out and about. Yep. You sanitize your hands. You mm-hmm. continue and carry on, and you just have courtesy for everybody else. Like, you can't just stop the world because of a virus. It has been, it has been the worst two years. I'm self-employed. So they shut everything down. They shut my store down. It was just mayhem for the last two years. I am so done with it. And the fear-mongering from the government and the health officials and all of that needs to stop. All right. Just stop the stop. fear-mongering. Stop it. Already. Stop it. Gotcha. Loud and clear, Elizabeth. Thank you. All the best. Get Cheers. well soon. Get the, get well yep. soon, Elizabeth. I hope, hope you're okay. Josh Stitzville, you're on City News. Josh. Well, good morning, Rob. Hi, uh, Josh. I'll start by saying thanks for having me on the show again. Okay. No problem. No uh, listen, problem. I I think we uh, we should just ride it out. Ride it out. Okay. We've we've been doing this for a long time now, but I also think we need to be responsible. Like the last caller uh, said about wearing masks. Uh, I think what we've been doing with our kids too is if they have any kind of a symptom, regardless of what it is, we send them to school with a mask on. Because I'm not I, I'm not ready to have people get sick again. And summer's coming, and I need my summer with no mask. Gotcha. So, gotcha. you know, okay. I think we just all need to be responsible. And if you're feeling a little bit down, put a mask on. That's, you know, take the initiative yourself instead of making everybody have to just because there's some silly people out there. Gotcha, Josh. Thank you. Thank right. you, sir. Yep. Thank Bye-bye. You. Yep. Norm in Ottawa, you're on City News. Good morning, Norm. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good, Norm. Thank you for calling. Uh, so the sixth wave is here. You've heard what some of the previous callers have said. Uh, let's ride it out. What do you think? Well, I agree with all of them. I think we've had enough mandates already. 
But if you go to all the stores and everything, first of all, all the companies are mandating that their employees wear masks. And I've been to Walmart, Loblaws, Costco. 95% of the people that are shopping are wearing masks. So I think it's just up to the individual person to right. decide. I, after all, only one out of two persons has to wear a mask in a room. But this idea that masks need to be mandated, you don't think that's necessary? No, that's, because most, that's, most people are wearing them anyway. Right. Most people are wearing them anyway, right? So Yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's up to us. I think it's we've had enough us. of our rights taken away, and we should you know, just be left up to us in common sense. Gotcha, Norm. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Bit of a Thanks. scratchy uh, phone connection there. A couple of lines available for the first time this morning. Gabby in Orleans. Gabby. I agree with Elizabeth. Okay. I am so done with it. I okay. um, I think this has to stop. What are we panicking about now? It's just a cold. We don't even hear about cold well, and, I mean, and cold, flu. Uh, Everything is COVID. Yeah, yeah, a cold doesn't usually put people in ICU, though. There are people in ICU because of well, COVID. Well, but right, so. did people not go into ICU um, before when they got, when there was flu around and all that? They would develop pneumonia? Sometimes, yes, yes. Yeah. Especially it's, frail frail elderly people, yes. Yes, yeah. so it's, it's, what's the difference? Man, oh man, I'm so tired of yeah, it. Yeah. And, and someone saying about, yeah, yeah, when you go into a store, wear a mask. Right. Uh, I am so done with it. By the way, I did get COVID from my son, and um, and what was that like was for you? A uh, cold. It was, it like was a cold? just a cold. Okay. And I'm 75 years old. Right. Okay. You okay. know, and and here our lives have been put on hold for two years. We don't have. I don't have that much time left in my life. And you can't travel. You you can't go anywhere. And oh, I just want to live my life and not be scared anymore. And this fear mongering. People are freaking out. Okay. I'm not trying to fear monger, Gabby. I'm just trying to well, gather opinions. You know, I'm so, not yeah. talking about you. No, 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 that's fine. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm Gabby. Just, yep, yep. Oh, when, when there's right. talking yeah, you're, you're about tired of this, you know, oh, we've got to tighten things up again and close things uh, down again. You're sick of hearing all of that. Right? I yeah. am yeah, so I, done with I, it. I, I hear you there. Yeah, thanks, oh, Gabby. You're all welcome. the best bye to you. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, halftime already. Wow. <laughs> Wow, not much appetite for any kind of rollback uh, going back to the days of mask mandates, capacity restrictions seems to be off the table for a lot of people. Well, not a lot of people, but all the people that have called this hour. You have a dissenting opinion. Uh, by all means, you know, we're open to it all here. We can disagree without being disagreeable on the Rob Snow Show right after the news. Talk back hour. This is City News. The Calgary Stampede is a world-renowned festival celebrating wrangling, bull riding, and everything cowboy. But did you know that many people credit its origins to a black Canadian? Take a minute to meet John Ware. The word cowboy has racist roots. Before the American Civil War, white ranchers were called cowhands, but the enslaved black men and women working alongside them were actually referred to as cowboys to infantilize and disrespect black ranchers. The legend of cowboy John Ware is full of impressive feats and awe-inspiring skill, including the ability to train even the wildest Broncos and easily hold a horse on its back. But the real story of John Ware is one that starts from more humble beginnings. Ware was born into slavery in the United States, gaining his freedom towards the end of the American Civil War in 1865. Ware's skills with cattle ranching developed as he traveled throughout the United States, eventually settling in a town southwest of present-day Calgary, Alberta, which made him one of the first black pioneers in the prairies. Over time, news of Ware and his amazing cowboy skills began to spread, and people came from across North America to witness his horsemanship and skills as a rancher. Eventually, Ware went on to own many of his own ranches. In 1892, he became the first man in Western Canada to earn the title of steer wrestler, and Ware's feats in local contests set the stage for the Calgary Stampede Rodeo we know today. 
in September of 1905, where he was killed in a freak accident with his horse, and more than 10,000 mourners from across the region attended his funeral, making it one of the largest in Alberta history. Though his true story is difficult to separate from the legends around him, Ware's status as a respected forefather of cowboy skill continues to be celebrated today. Ware has dedicated monuments across Alberta, including several sites near his first ranch, a Calgary school in his namesake, and a building at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Thursday, March 31st. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, one degree in Smith Falls, two. Here's what's making news at this hour. The Ottawa Hospital lead scientist says he doesn't like the term waves when, returning to, when referring to COVID, but admits we are now in wave six. Dr. Doug Manuel says wastewater levels of COVID, which have been used as a measure for COVID in the community, is far outpacing the modeling numbers. The city's top doctor is also urging you to continue taking COVID precautions, distancing and mask wearing in public. Now, the province today reporting the number of people in hospital with COVID has risen to 807. That is up from 778 yesterday. Assembly of First Nations delegates met with Pope Francis for two hours today. That's an hour longer than had been scheduled at the Vatican. Another meeting is scheduled for tomorrow. This involves Francis as well as Métis, Inuit and First Nations. Representatives are all hoping the Pope issues an apology on behalf of the church for their role in residential schools in Canada. Francis has so far not made a commitment to that apology. Public inquiry into the April 2020 mass shooting in Nova Scotia, releasing documents that reveal in the seconds after a Mountie sped past a gunman, he had hesitated about pursuing the man. By the time the corporal did get turned around on a narrow road, the suspect was gone. Peterson did radio fellow officers, a driver of a replica cruiser was wearing a reflective vest and smiled as he went by. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says Russia promised to de-escalate operations near Kyiv. It appears units are not withdrawing. All they're doing is repositioning. City News Time, 1032. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Sixth wave. We are in the sixth wave of COVID-19. So what should officials do? Should they do anything? Most people who've called so far this hour say, no, they, they don't have to do anything. And restrictions, no, it's a non-starter for a lot of people. And we should ride it out, ride it out. I hear a lot of people, uh, you know, this is the popular opinion. I think it's, you know, it's not just on this show that where it's the prevailing opinion. I actually think it's the prevailing opinion nationwide. People... Uh, taking personal responsibility, their own health decisions, take personal ownership of it. Um, I mean, it was many months ago that it, it actually came up. Dr. Bonnie Henry, uh, the chief medical officer of health in British Columbia, called it self-management. Self-management. You know, there are free rapid tests in Ontario. I don't know how widely available they are. Have you tried to get any, David? I, I've never even tried to get any free rapid tests. Have you ever tried to get any? I, I, I personally know. have not, but I'm told you can get them at pharmacies. Yeah. If you ask. If you ask. They do still have right. some. That okay. program is right. still going on. Yep. Well, now it's in our newscast this morning. They'll be available until the end of July. It was supposed to expire, but they've extended it till the end of July, right? Um, you know, get them, use them. If you think you have COVID, take a rapid test. If you feel sick, stay home until you feel better. If, um, if you haven't had your shots, get your shots. You know, wear your mask. Even if it's not mandated, you can still wear a mask. If you're in a high-risk group, take extra precautions. Limit your contacts. You know, these, these sorts of things. It's this idea the onus is on us now, but that as a collective we're just not going to do this anymore. Go through this constant ringer of open and close and open and close and open. And, like, no, you hear it. You hear it this morning from the audience. Those days are over. Those days are 
over. Is that how you feel? Vince in Nepean, is that how you feel, Vince? Yeah, well, the way I look at it, man, Rob, is like this. We've gone through certain phases. We've gone through yeah. the educational information phase, which was masks and distancing and all that. Mm-hmm. We've gone through the vaccination, through the vaccination stages, which people got vaccinated. Yep. And now I think we're at the responsibility stage where everybody's responsible for whatever they do because if, if they don't they, you can't let the government babysit us forever right 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 so right, i'm yeah. uh, i'm i'm against uh, new restrictions do because of what i just said yeah uh, there's no more that anybody can do for us unless we do it ourselves okay vince i think that's pretty well said vince thank you very much yep yeah okay see i that, like yeah. You see the dominant theme this morning. Paul in Canada. Paul, you're on City News. Yeah, hi, Rob. Hi, Paul. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, like the the uh, wastewater indications are all up, like you said. Yeah. Uh, I actually think in some ways that's maybe a good thing. It kind of depends on how bad this variant is. But uh, I see it as if it's out there, we're building immunity as a community, right? Okay. And uh, uh, the other thing is um, uh, the part that's not in our control uh, generally is if the hospital numbers start rising and, and uh, on this uh, website, 613covid.ca, that shows that, uh, apparently the hospital numbers aren't going up. But if they do, then uh, I think it's the same story in every wave. The only reason we had lockdowns and shutdowns was because our health system is being overloaded right right, right so that's right. the fear uh the good thing is right now the hospital numbers don't seem to be going up but they may i think that's that's what they're afraid of but what i what i wonder about is for two years now we've had this uh pandemic and trudeau said we can't talk about health care funding. We're in the middle of a pandemic, which never made any sense. I thought of all the times to talk about health care funding, it's in the middle of a pandemic, right? Okay. And, uh, you know, the permanent funding, right? I, I think at the heart of the issue is we generally don't have the capacity when uh, ICU numbers go up. And when they do, and there's no more room in the ICUs, I don't think the government really has any choice but to say, look, guys, we got to start... Uh, Tightening things up. Yeah, I, I, like I, I agree with the general principle. Let's try to keep it the way it is now, uh, but keep an eye on those uh, hospital numbers. Hopefully, they won't go up. But if they start taking off, I don't think there's a you whole. Might not lot of have choice. any choice. Okay. Yeah. All right, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Something to think about there. Yeah, I spent some time on the Ottawa Public Health website this morning. The COVID nineteen dashboard. You know, lots of charts, lots of graphs. Looks to me. Um, you know, the trend is not our friend. The, the, the charts are, are not moving in the right direction. But, you know, an, another issue is we just don't test the way we used to in the volumes that we used to. Ottawa Public Health says 815 reported cases in the last seven days. But what does that number even mean? Heard Dr. Manuel say, I don't even look at cases anymore. There's like a meaningless data point. All right. But, as, you know, to our previous caller, Local hospitals. Ottawa Public Health says eight patients are in the hospital because of an active infection. And they're using this language deliberately because of, not necessarily with COVID-19, because of COVID-19 and no ICU cases. And now OPH is actually breaking this data down a little bit more. It says 46 patients are in hospital with COVID-19. But it says 16 in hospital because of COVID-19. 16 in total, 8 with an active infection. The other 30 are in hospital because of something else. They just happen to have COVID-19. So is that significant? It's interesting, if if nothing else. And a total of two COVID-19 cases in ICU in Ottawa hospitals because of COVID-19. That's the reason they're in ICU. Three patients in ICU with COVID-19, but not because of COVID-19. Nice to have some clarity on that. But the worry from Dr. Etches, this was expressed in the statement from Dr. Etches yesterday, 
is that the hospitalizations are a lagging indicator. The wastewater is a leading indicator. Then you see it in the case counts. They go up, and later people end up in the hospital. So there may just be 16 people in the hospital and two in the ICU. Now, because of COVID-19, the worry is that number is going to go up, and it could go up exponentially. As for capacity in the hospitals, I checked this at around 4 o'clock this morning. Okay, 98% of acute care beds occupied. ICU beds, 75% occupied. ICU beds with ventilators, 33% capacity. So when it comes to so-called surge capacity, there would seem to be room, but not much, because there's never, ever, ever (laughs) much surge capacity in any Ontario hospital. So what should we do here? Let's get back to the phones. Brenda in Almont. Good morning, Brenda. You're on City News. Good morning, Rob. Hi, Brenda. I just want to say that I don't think we should go to back to uh, mask mandates and have it all closed down. I've been two years locked into an apartment, not been able to do anything. Right. And I'm just sick and tired of it. I just want to get outside and go someplace and even just look through a window in a shop just to get a change of scenery. And I think if you're being vigilant and you sanitize and you're wearing a mask and when you're out in a crowd or whatever and being careful, I think that's all we need. And if people people think that they have to be told by the government to put a mask on, then they must be pretty stupid. Like they really have to realize that this is this is on their own shoulders. They have to take care of themselves. We've been told for two years what to do. We should know by now. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. All right. Thank you thanks. for sharing your opinion. Up next uh, on line two is Darlene in Nepean. Hi, Darlene. Hi, Rob. Hi, Darlene. What should the government do here? It's the sixth well, wave. Well, uh, I think masks should be mandatory. Okay. And the other, you know, social distancing, hand washing, just common sense things. Yeah. Um, I'll go with on the side of Dr. Vera Etches, always have. She's sensible, not talking about business shutdowns now. It's about talking about precautions. So this won't happen and keeping an eye out. And wastewater, it's a viable testing method. It really is. Okay, okay. So I'm not ditching my mask, that's for sure. All right, all right, Darlene. All the best, thank you. Thank you, darling. Bye bye. Uh, two lines available there. Steve in Canada. Steve, you're on City News. Hey, how you doing today? Good, Steve. Thank you. I have four things I want to say. The four, four thing. things are, are we have therapies that can help COVID. So why are we still reacting to the pandemic like we are, like we did in the beginning when we had no vaccines or therapeutics? Okay. We need buildings to accommodate COVID patients, and this will allow people with cancers and other situations to have their treatments. A lot of people are scared and are flooding the hospitals that probably don't need to be there and they should stay at home instead and another thing is why don't we have times for vulnerable and elderly people to have special times to shop so they are not at risk so many of us are not annoyed with situations like mask mandates and locking us down again this is my perspective yeah i'm really interested in the last part i remember early in the pandemic steve you remember they had like seniors hours at the grocery store they did and i thought that was awesome that was awesome Yeah. yeah 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 and i think i think that's a better way of doing it and then instead of making everybody having to follow a blanketed effect because when you blanket everybody to have to follow the same rules and regulations you're going to have a lot of people upset yeah yeah great point steve thank you thank Thank you you for sharing them yep bye-bye let's take this one ron and barhaven good morning ron good morning rob yeah Uh, yeah i couldn't agree more about the uh i don't see why the uh, grocery store costco those guys all have a uh, 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 one hour, whatever, before everybody else. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, everybody's talking about masks. I, nobody's talking about the type of mask. If you're, if you are uh, uh, vulnerable, you got to wear an N95. The, the cloth masks and paper masks don't work. You, you've got to wear an N95, and you can't touch your face. Sanitize, yes, but. Herd, herd immunity, that, that comes from, from natural immunity, and, and that's been kind of skirted. That issue's been skirted, in my opinion. I don't know why. Um, I, I got sick in February 2020. Somebody, uh, my wife and one of my sons got uh, COVID uh, two weeks ago. 
Uh, they were in the house. They didn't go out. Um, I never got sick, of course, well, because, like I said, I had it in February 2020. But I think that's that's the thing. You've you got to wear an N95. Don't touch your face. Sanitize your hands. And, and let's do this, this early senior shopping thing again. All right, Ron, thank you. Thank you. Be right back with the final quarter. A couple of lines available there. Rob Snow Show, Talk Back Hour. The sixth wave is here. What should the government do? What should officials do? Anything? Nothing? Bring back mask mandates, bring back capacity limits, tighten things up, or let's ride it out. Let's ride it out and use some common sense. That seems to be the prevailing opinion so far. Share yours at 750-1310. This is City News. To talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. So the question is, we have about 10 minutes to take some more calls here. Six wave is here. What should officials do? Anything or nothing? You want restrictions to make a comeback or you want to ride this out? Michelle in Ottawa South, you're on City News. Good morning, Rob. Well, what prompted my call today was the um, the conversation about the rapid testing. And I can tell you here in our area that at the Metro, the Shoppers Drug Mart, the pharmacy, they have them piled up at the caches when you're checking out. Right. And all you have to do is say, you know, can I have one? And they, they have ample and they're giving them away. So they're very adequately stocked in that respect. The other thing is because the numbers are indicating it's so high. So if you do have the sniffles, then perhaps assume you already have it. 
you can get the testing and do it but you know exercise caution and um this past Friday, I was lucky enough to attend an event where the Premier was. And the Premier led by an example. He covered his face the whole time. And that was really responsible because the number of people he meets, everybody wants to whisper in his ear, touch him, you know. And so I thought, wow, well, he's really... And nobody... Some people were uh, protecting themselves. Other people were just, you know, going free. It wasn't an issue with anybody. So... On Sunday night, the night of the big slap, I was at the general hospital, (laughs) (laughs) and I was surprised when I went in there how empty the place was, so maybe Academy Awards night is the night to attend, but no, there was hardly anybody there. Uh, Very good service, uh, you know, and they're still practicing all the protocols, and so I think we have a very good check on this. Okay. Also, we're we're heading into what I would call a chronological uh, provision election and we managed to have a federal election recently that we spent a lot of money on and changed nothing just gave us a government nobody voted for and so if it can be done federally it certainly can be done safely and we have more available to us so I think it's time now to start living and again the premier mentioned last week if you're older and you're not feeling good go to your doctor get the testing have the antiviral so everything's in place okay. and again that's you know i think they're doing a great job okay all right michelle thank you thank you for your thank call you. yep taz in ottawa you're on city news what should happen here we're in a sixth wave taz well i think the government should stay away from it but i do think there's some policies that we, we're going to be smart here okay. I, I say something about the elders because uh one of the callers mentioned about we do have the therapeutics of the hospital but you know we're rationing our medical system to something similar to north korea or cuba i would say something in between and we we just you know just when there's a little bit of a a, a, a hit my goodness the system can't properly address it unlike some other european or american country because they have uh, uh, you know vast you know beds and all that we have a bed capacity you know the prime minister is saying that i think it's ridiculous so we do have the therapeutics and so to be smart about this when you look at the senior home they're the ones that are vulnerable that's the issue there so and i think that's the other thing testing 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 is really key to this i say stay open let's uh, extend that testing encourage people to get tested and and, and you got to have those uh, PSW testing all the time uh, keep the uh, vulnerable nursing homes uh, testing and, and and those masks uh, if possible to those uh, uh, nursing homes and you know those uh, we're wearing these flimsy masks I think that the uh, it's the n95 mask you know I think that that should have been done and I, I think the government should give that out free <laughs> you know at, at all okay. the pharmacies okay. that, that Okay. That would have been probably a little better, too, by the way. Okay, Taz, thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Lots of ideas there. Lots of ideas. Uh, Dave, Smith Falls. Dave, good morning. Hey, Rob. Hey. I'm calling about, I'm calling about the wastewater numbers. Okay. I think, a lot, I think a lot of people get really excited when they hear that the levels are up high. Well, if that's not transferring into people going to the hospital sick, it really doesn't make much of a difference to me. What it sounds like it's like the asymptomatic thing where there's probably a ton of people that do have a very mild version of it, mm-hmm. uh, aren't very sick, aren't taking up medical facilities, and we need to just kind of roll with it, live with it, move on. Um, I've been waiting for a major surgery for about a year now. Uh, it's oh. been a major hassle for me. Okay. I finally got my surgery date, and I don't want to hear any more talk about this uh, bringing back measures and playing it safe because that's what we've done for two years, and it didn't get us anything. All right, Dave. Good luck with your surgery, Dave. Glad that's finally uh, getting going. And I, <laughs> I know a few people who've had to deal with that delayed surgeries. Uh, Rodney. Good morning, Rodney. Hey, good morning. Hi. Hi, Rodney. Uh, hey, so I got an analogy that I got to uh, ask you about. Okay. You know, is it easier to put out a fire when it first starts or when it's raging out of control? Okay. Yeah, I think we all know the answer to that. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, uh, nice that somebody else talked about the surgery thing because one of your... Well, you were waiting for surgery, weren't you, uh, Rodney? Well, I, I, yeah, and I went through getting canceled, you know, several times. And then, you know, the surgery that I was waiting for, it was heart surgery. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's you get it or you don't get it and maybe you're alive you're not alive but 
the part that I wanted to sort of mention was one of your uh, political commentators this morning mentioned that her father got COVID in the hospital after waiting to get there for a procedure. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, that does, doesn't make sense to me. You know, I'm not the doctor, but I'm thinking that waiting at waiting for the procedure, they were exposed to COVID. They went to the hospital, they got tested, they got diagnosed with COVID, they right. got sent home to recover. And then you just had another caller that was... He's been waiting a year for his procedure, you know. So there's a lot of people that are waiting for health procedures that, you know, I'm going to think of somebody I saw on the TV, and I'm glad that you weren't the person talking to him. And this is a couple of months ago when he was talking about he had a golf ball tumor of cancer in his lungs, and he was in his mid-60s, and he says, if I got it out now, this week, you know, but my, my operation's canceled, I'll have some good quality of life for a few years, and who knows what it's going to be like in a few weeks or a few months, you know. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And then so and Rodney, then Rodney, we're we're a little tight on time here, Rodney. But I, what I want to get at, I want you to answer that. Like the the question is, we're in a sixth wave, right? So should the officials be doing anything? Should they bring back mask mandates? Should they bring back capacity limits, or or do we ride this out? Given you know the vaccination levels, let people. Um, self-manage their own care take personal responsibility of it instead of using this kind of like blunt instrument across the entire community what do you think we're in this political situation that nothing's going to be done about it something should be done about it i mm. feel something should be done about it and everybody's going to have to wait and see and all the people that want to run with it you know i'm hoping they just have the time to take a vacation to spain go to barcelona and run with the bulls and then <laughs> okay. you have a choice, right. you know. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. You make some good points, especially on the politics of it all. You know, can you really see it happening? I, I, I just don't see it happening. You know, the election is for like two months from now, a month from now, the riddle drop. Do you really see this premier reimposing public health restrictions with an election call a month from now? I don't see it happening. And I wonder how it would go over. Given what I've heard this morning, you know, how would that go over? If you picture it, Doug Ford calls a news conference. He's standing there with Christine Elliott and the and and Dr. Moore, the chief medical officer of health, and he does the folks and friends and folks and friends, and nobody wants to be here. But I said, your safety is the number one priority, and we have to close things up, and the mask mandate is back, and capacity limits, I'm sorry to report they're coming back too. How would that go over? You know, that would that would be viewed as a huge admission of a, a failure uh, or a government that's just out of ideas, but that's kind of where we are right now where political science is probably playing a bigger role than, than medical science in many of these decisions. Anyway, coming up, housing affordability. I had a chance this morning to speak with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Steve Clark, on their latest attempt legislatively uh, to make housing more affordable here in the province of Ontario. That interview is coming up next on City News.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Thursday, March 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, one degree. It's two degrees in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. The sixth wave of COVID-19 is here in Ottawa. It's coming much quicker than anticipated. The province is reporting the number of people in hospital with COVID has climbed to 807 province-wide today, up from 778 yesterday. Wastewater COVID levels are higher than the modeling numbers show, and City News reports Chris Curries has more from the Ottawa Hospital's Dr. Doug Manuel. Two weeks ago, Dr. Doug Manuel was confident we were in a good place. Now, he's hedging. We're seeing um, a more rapid increase in our wastewater signal than, than I had anticipated based on the model. He says we haven't seen the hospitalizations go up yet, but they typically lag behind. And while he doesn't watch the case counts anymore, the numbers are staggering. I'd estimate we're more in the range of 5,000. If someone said 10,000 cases a day in Ottawa, I wouldn't I wouldn't blink. The epidemiologist and senior scientist with the Ottawa Hospital worries now about absentee rates for essential services. Chris Curry's City News. City News time 1101 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. It's a mild finish to the month of March. We'll climb to 14 for the high today with some wet weather at times. Chance of an isolated thunderstorm as well and a gusty wind out of the south. Tonight a few showers. Showers ending late this evening, then partly cloudy overnight, the low 3. For today, the high 14. And right now in Ottawa, 1 degree, it's 2 degrees in Smith Falls. The head of NATO says Russia does not appear to be scaling back any military operation in Ukraine. The Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says Russia promised to de-escalate operations near the capital, Kyiv, during recent ceasefire negotiations. We have heard the recent statements that Russia will scale down military operations around Kyiv and in northern uh, Ukraine. But Russia has repeatedly lied about its intentions. So we can only judge Russia on its actions, not on its words. As Stoltenberg says Russian units are not withdrawing, he says they're merely repositioning. He says Russia is trying to regroup, resupply and reinforce its offensive in the Donbass region. The public inquiry into the April 2020 mass shooting in Nova Scotia has released more documents. They reveal in the seconds after a Mountie sped past the gunman, he hesitated about pursuing the man. By the time this corporal got turned around on a narrow road in Nova Scotia, the suspect was gone. The killer apparently had pulled into a driveway less than a minute after the corporal passed him. The officer drove by, not realizing the suspect had left the road. StatsCan reports the economy grew by 0.2 percent in January as surging COVID-19 cases prompted another round of restrictions. Goods producing industries drove gains in January with the construction sector growing for the third time in four months and wholesale trade posting its largest monthly gains since July 2020. Residential construction grew 4.3 percent which more than offset the previous two months of contractions. But the service sector registered zero growth with accommodation and food services and the arts, entertainment and recreation sectors recording their largest monthly decline since the first wave of the pandemic. Don Kelly, the Canadian Press. City News Time 1104. Ottawa police say the number of impaired driving charges to start this year are back to pre-pandemic levels. 146 impaired charges were laid between January 1st and yesterday. Police say almost half the charges resulted from collisions. This month alone, there have been 54 impaired charges laid compared to 43 in the same month last year. Police say with more people prepping for things like cycling and walking or hopping on an e-scooter again, they're concerned and remind you even a small amount of drugs or alcohol in your system can impair your driving ability. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Well, it's no secret that there is a housing affordability crisis all across the country, here in Ontario, here in Eastern Ontario. 
Now, the Ontario government has been trying to, to figure out ways to make housing more affordable with a major focus on increasing housing supply. Let's build more homes. Let's build them faster. The government had a housing affordability task force that made dozens of recommendations. Uh, some of them didn't sit well with municipal planners here in Ottawa. They feared a loss of local control. But now there is new legislation being proposed by the Ontario government, by the Ford government, called the More Homes for Everyone Act. And to talk about it, we're joined by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing this morning, Steve Clark. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Thanks yeah. for having me back on the show. Yeah, Appreciate thank you, uh, Minister, for coming on the show. You stand accused this morning, Steve Clark, by your critics of ignoring many of the recommendations that were made in that report from your own task force. How do you respond to that? Well, the, the bill that I tabled yesterday, Rob, uh, more homes for everyone, is, is uh, in the immediate term. It's, we need to make some smart targeted policies now uh, to get shovels in the ground faster for families. And over the longer term, the task force report uh, that I commissioned uh, is our government's housing roadmap. So it's the longer term proposal. You're right. Uh, there was a lot of criticism, especially by municipalities. They told us very clearly uh, that they aren't ready to implement the ambitious policies, the bold uh, recommendations from the task force right now. Uh, so my plan is in the long term is to is to get a working group together this summer to ensure that municipalities actively support and are willing to implement these policies. And we've seen this before, right? So in my 2019 More Homes, More Choice, my housing supply action plan, we provided a number of recommendations to municipalities that they either, either haven't for the most part implemented or they've looked at ways of trying to, to neutralize um, the policy. And and, and despite all of that, despite all of that, we're still seeing record housing starts in the province. You know, you look at Ottawa starts in 2021, highest we've seen since going back to like early, the early 70s. I think it was 1973. Uh, we're seeing purpose-built rental uh, highs all across this Ontario, all across the province of Ontario. But we still have, and this was overwhelming in our consultations, long drawn-out processes that are delaying housing, not just pushing the dream of home ownership out of reach for people, but just making life more affordable, unaffordable because the, the, the time that it's taking, the delays, are, are adding a tremendous amount of cost to the end product for the end user. So yeah. we've got to make those changes. And, and the other thing, Rob, I'll say is, is we commit as a government to implement those task force recommendations. And we also commit that as a government, we're going to have a housing supply action plan bill every four years, starting in 2022, 2023. So this is a longer term push. The bill yesterday deals with the immediate term. So how can you incentivize municipalities and try to get municipalities to to expedite development well we, we, we put our money where our mouth is you know we've we've ensured that uh, there's a lot of dollars put in the system to improve efficiency uh, for site plan subdivision approvals uh, the measures that are in the bill uh, complement we, we, we've made a commitment of over 350 million dollars to municipalities to help them make their planning and approvals process more efficient. So we put our money where our mouth is. The most recent was the $45 million streamlining development approval fund that the Premier and I announced to big city mayors uh, in January. Uh, we've also got to create that common data standard. One of the things we heard right across was the processes are different in every municipality. In some cases, they take years to get a permit through the system and, and to get ultimately shovels in the ground. That's far too long. So we need to work collaboratively uh, to facilitate e-permitting, to improve data sharing, but we've got to find efficiencies and we've got to accelerate approval timelines. That's key to build more homes faster. Okay. Some people are wondering now how much of the housing affordability problem will actually be solved by 
Market forces and a return to um, a more normal interest rate environment. Uh, you know, the Bank of Canada is already raising interest rates. We know, everybody knows about inflation. Um, as a housing minister, what do you say to that? Yeah, you know, I, th I think there's a there's a lot of uh, smarter people than I that have, uh, have weighed in on that. I, I, I am certainly uh, feeling that the federal government we, we need to have them in the game as well, and uh, we're going to be watching uh, the budget very closely okay. uh, to see whether there are housing improvement measures. Um, you know, I, I'm focused on what I can focus on, right? So I, I'm I'm the planning and zoning guy, and I've put together uh, a suite of reforms in a bill that I think will make uh, much improvement to the situation. It will build upon the success of our previous plan. Uh, demand still uh, outpaces supply, and the best way for me to deal with that is to uh, make sure that permits that are in the system get through it and that we put a plan in place to, to make more housing opportunities available. So I, okay. I'll control what I can control. Well, you can control how you how your relationship with municipal planners. And I, I several weeks ago, I had the chance to speak with a top planner here in the city, Mr. Willis. Then um, they were concerned that uh, you know, the recommendations from your task force would result in a loss of community control over things like heritage designations, the makeup of local neighborhoods, uh, height limits in neighborhoods. So, so uh, from, you know, from a macro view, how, how do you view the province's relationship with the municipalities which control so much of, the, of, of development in their communities? Well, 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 one of the things, Rob, that we heard loud and clear from uh, municipalities uh, in regards to not uh, implementing the housing uh, housing task force recommendations was, was some of the com comments that, that your chief planner made. And, and I think the first step in that longer term getting municipalities on board is that consultation we're launching on multi-generational community as a concept to bring in that more gentle density into neighborhoods. We want to create a climate where um, you know, multi-generational communities exist. Uh, municipalities told us they're not ready to implement those ambitious policies. So this summer, we'll, we'll appoint a working group. We'll get municipalities around the table. Um, we've got to address the root causes of the housing supply crisis. We need an ambitious forward-thinking plan like we saw with the recommendations of the task force report. But we also need municipalities at the table. You know, we've seen this before. Um, things like additional residential units and the community benefits charge framework, which were part of my uh, initiatives two years ago, we've either seen that they haven't been implemented by planning staff and municipalities, or they placed additional conditions on them to neutralize them. We, we, we have to stop that. We have to use every tool that's available to us. Um, and we've got to get municipalities on board or this isn't going to work. And, and, and the fact that so many of them came out against the task force plan just showed that there has to be more work to do if we're going to create a climate in Ontario where um, we can improve this housing supply crisis. Municipalities need to be at the table. They, we can't afford to have them fighting with, uh, with higher levels of government. All right, I want to ask you about one, one other thing unrelated to the housing situation, but uh, about a file that you're very familiar with, um, and that is the future of what used to be the Kempville Agricultural College. Uh, I remember interview, interviewing a very upset Steve Clark the day that the Wynn government announced that it was going to close that college. Um, that was many years ago now. There's an opinion piece in the Ottawa Citizen today where a number of people in uh, the agri sciences uh, lament the, the, the loss of the land and the buildings that are going to, 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 to disappear from that site because the plan, it, it, as I understand it, is it for it to become a new provincial remand center, basically a new jail. Uh, they want your colleague in, in cabinet, Lisa Thompson, agriculture, food, rural affairs minister, not to transfer that land. How would you respond to that, Mr. Clark? Steve? Well, well, first of all, over 600 acres of agriculture land were already transferred to the municipality. So the municipality already, you know, North Grenville, 
uh, already controls over 600 acres of agricultural land as part of an agreement with the Agricultural Research Institute of Ontario. So that deal was done uh, a number of years ago before the correctional complex was added. So the remaining um, property uh, and buildings, obviously, you know, I, I believe that the correctional uh, complex is a, is a positive. You know, those are good paying jobs. I've seen it uh, in the correctional complex that's literally around the corner from my house in Brockville, the St. Lawrence uh, Correctional and Treatment Center. So I, I think having those correctional uh, jobs in the community is a positive. I think having that uh, development is a, is a positive and it, it will provide a good economic opportunity. It'll, it'll, it'll pay for itself uh, in terms of ensuring that there's not, uh, you know, costs for infrastructure by the municipality. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, I've committed right from the first day this facility was announced that the remaining land, the lands that aren't being used for the correctional complex, should be transferred back to the municipality. The, the Solicitor General's office has agreed on a number of Zoom calls that uh, that the priority for the, for the community is that, and, and we're going to put a plan in place to do that. So those buildings, uh, you know, I, I, I still believe can be part of a bigger plan that I hope the municipality has for, you know, agriculture opportunities on that site. We had Minister Thompson in the riding uh, during the March break. Uh, she's very keen on opportunities at the campus. But, but let's not let's not confuse things. There are 600 acres of, of farmland that the municipality controls um, and, and, and is protected. Uh, and, and any piece of property that isn't being used for that correctional complex, I'm going to fight as hard as I ever have to include that property as part of the municipal uh, agricultural long-term plan that uh, that I'm hoping um, you know they'll agree with me on. All right, Steve Clark, thank you for the time, sir. Good talking to you. The past few years. We're talking about preparing your car for spring. And Mike, the next thing that comes to mind, and I think a lot of people probably feel this way, is that, you know, windshield washer fluid. Like, why do I even bother using summer fluid? Why don't I just keep that winter stuff in so I never have to think about it? What's the difference between those two exactly, Mike? Pretty much uh, one one has a lot more alcohol content than the other, and that's the winter, uh, the winter washer fluid, and that's going to help uh, de-ice. It's going to keep everything good, and then most importantly, it's not going to freeze when it's uh, when it's up. Whereas um, the summer fluid, it's more of a I almost call it like a bit of a degreaser, right? Like okay. they they uh, it, it's good for getting bugs off, you know, bug spray wash, that type of stuff. All the grime and junk that can come and hit your uh, hit your windshield in the in the summer times, it, it's it aids a little bit more like that, and it doesn't have as much alcohol content, so it is a little more susceptible to freezing in the in the winter months. Well, we also know that winter is very very hard on the interior of your car because you know you're getting that in and out of the car, that salt and sand and so forth. Um, salt stains are a big thing for people that especially if they're cleaning the car themselves any recommendations in getting rid of those salt stains uh, salt's the worst especially if you if you don't have like a like a rubber winter liner or a rubber floor mat or something in the winter time it just can cake everywhere and it and it gets very hard and it calcifies and it's it's some nasty stuff but you know what just a very very simple fix half water half vinegar and okay. you mix that into a spray bottle or something like that and the vinegar the acid in it just softens all that stuff up and then you can uh, wipe it off or vacuum it out it's a good uh, it's a good little household uh, um, uh, hack there if you will yeah uh, Mike I'm embarrassed to say and I said it to you off camera so I'll be honest on camera wiper blades I've probably had mine for four years and I have noticed that deterioration has been happening you know much longer than 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 should be how often should we be changing our wiper blades I mean probably one of the biggest things we should do right for safety reasons for sure and and, and you know what it is one of those I don't blame you one bit it's it's one of those things that if it 
out of sight, out of mind, right? If right. it works, it works. And if it doesn't, that's when it's time to do it. But <laughs> really, um, I would I would highly recommend replacing them at least twice a year, you know, just going into the summer and then going into the winter. Uh, that's that's generally a good time frame because it's one of those things that is just you take for granted. It's so important uh, to be uh, to, 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 to have proper wipers so that you can see out the windshield. And if they don't at one little point or the bra- blades start to, to rip or deteriorate, rate it's uh it's not going to be a good situation yeah. so highly recommend about uh about twice a year if you can and you're able on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 a.m let's return to transit related issues in the city Long meeting of the Transit Commission yesterday. Riley Brockington is a city councillor, represents River Ward, and is also a member of the Transit Commission. Morning, councillor. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, How nice, are you? I'm good. Nice to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. So there will be an annual fare increase as of May 1st. What do you think of raising fares right now? Well, it's never a good time. Certainly, uh, the long-range financial plan of OC Transpo looks at a steady and um, uh, sort of unified fare increase of 2.5%. Obviously, the troubles of the last few years make any type of fare increase hard pill to swallow for many residents uh, and users of the system. The challenge, though, is that um, unless that long-range financial plan is revised, and there are revisions coming in Q2 of this year, later this spring, uh, you can't offer the same service uh, year after year without uh, an additional revenues. And some of that come from fare increase. The Commission does need to have a much deeper conversation about how we finance public transit going forward. Uh, but at this point, we heard yesterday, May 1st is the scheduled date. Okay. On having that deeper conversation about how public transit is is financed, what are some of the options that should be on the table when that discussion happens? Well, there aren't a whole lot, Rob. Right now, there are two main sources of funding. One is from the property tax base. There's a transit levy that property uh, owners uh, contribute to every year. It's approximately half and the fair, fair revenues that our passengers who use OC Transpo contribute to, and that is approximately half. Uh, there's talks about whether upper levels of government who have contributed uh, mostly to capital over the years and very much appreciate those investments because to build, for example, the LRT is, is a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar project. Haven't been a lot of dollars uh, other than at COVID for operating. And so is there a right. greater role for upper levels of government to contribute to the operating side? And that's sort of what my motion to yesterday spoke to with our operating side has been significantly impacted with COVID. We don't want to decimate public transit by, by cutting you know half of the service, for example. Um, so that's part of the conversation that yeah. has to happen. Right. Uh, but why not look at cutting half the service? If only half the people are using it. If we don't have revenue stability, uh, that is ultimately going to have to come at the table at some point. We don't want to get to that. As you cut service, you impact people. They start to review their options other than public transit, and the service just gets worse and worse because you have less and less funds coming into it. So this is definitely the time to have that conversation, and within a couple months, we will. Okay, this idea of having free transit, it would appear that more people opted for public transit when it was free. I know Councillor Menard and some of his council colleagues are, you know, they really want to push this. I'm using free in quotation marks. It wouldn't be free. It would have to be covered some other way, maybe through your idea, upper levels of government, whatever. Um... How feasible is that, though? Is it something you would like to look at? It's not financially fair, feasible. free, fair, yeah. free transit. You know, I well, you know, to Councillor Menard's credit, he did mention a number of times where transit has been free, either through LRT 
um, uh, promotions or opportunities where transit was provided free there you know Canada Day and New Year's Eve as well and, and other points we, we financially cannot afford it at this point you have to have a, a much larger conversation about how public transit is financed what those funding sources are there's only a certain point that taxpayers can afford if you're going to make taxpayers pay more in this area yeah. are you going to pay less in housing yeah. or infrastructure costs or other needs um, I think we should look at expanding uh, opportunities for people on low income. We do have subsidized passes. Is there an opportunity to target uh, these users even further with a further subsidy? Instead of giving free transit to everyone, can you really uh, focus your attention on the people who need the assistance right. the most? Put a means test on it, in other words, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I don't close the door on these. I, I just think you need to have a much more global discussion on some of the other factors before you make decisions in this regard so uh, my producer david and i were just doing sort of some quick math transit budgets about 690 million operating budget 690 million like almost 700 million dollars to run oc transpo for a year that's correct yes operating deficit our guess is probably it's probably about 130 or 140 million dollars the operating deficit for OC Transpo. Do you know the number? 2020 it was 124, 124 million dollar deficit. That was because of the uh, basically the plummeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Numbers yeah. But it's only COVID. back to 40 percent now. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Pre-COVID, just to be clear, pre-COVID we did not generate uh, deficits anywhere close to that. Um, but this is the dilemma we're in. Uh, COVID has, and, and the changing patterns of how people work and travel, post-secondary students aren't fully back in yet. We aren't even close to 100% capacity. The estimates used for the 2022 budget, as I've said before in your show, are pie-in-the-sky estimates that I've challenged, very ambitious. I don't think it was right to pass a budget that had estimates that were, weren't even close to what the reality yeah. will be in 2022. Yeah. So there are funds coming in 2022 from the feds to help public transit agencies across Canada with their budgets. I'm very concerned. Years going forward, we are the home to the federal public service. There will be a hybrid model. The numbers of, of pep federal public servants using transit on a five-day schedule, those days are gone, Rob. So how do you sustain a public transit service with now very expensive LRT if you don't have those fare revenues? That's why we have to have this conversation about the long-term financial plan. Oh, yes. Yeah and some other components that are coming up. But it's not financially feasible. If the Fed say, maybe there's a change in government, or the Fed say, listen, we've helped you out for three years. We now have other priorities we need to finance. You're on your own. We, we have some significant challenges in this city. And oh, yes. I, I keep reminding my, my fellow commissioners, we cannot lose sight of this. We have to be playing the long game here and get our ducks ready because that day can come sooner rather than later and we have to be prepared what are we going to do so that's that's the framework that's happening now and i'm very interested in what will be coming in a couple months i believe at fedco with respect to the long-range uh, plan that finance staff yes. are working. and i don't know if this came up yesterday but the last time this city has a fuel hedging policy as you know and it enters into contracts and buys its fuel in bulk 50 million dollars 50 million liters of diesel fuel a year for the city a lot of that for oc transpo and i know there's Absolutely. plans to electrify the fleet but those you know the, that's a multi-year plan the last time the city bought diesel fuel it was getting its diesel for much closer to a dollar a liter yes diesel's two dollars a liter now you know fuel costs have doubled basically and oc yeah. transpo is not going to be immune to that either no not at all many departments that uh uh, have vehicles including the police and others are feeling that that pinch with the number of vehicles on the road yeah, uh, somebody we, should start asking the treasurer you know <laughs> maybe to reveal some details what's this what's this doing to the to the city's finances yeah, okay that's, that's true. councillor brockington thank you for the time thank you yeah, Rob, speak soon. bye bye from river right. ward transit commissioner riley brockington when we come back it's the world with professor 
Elliot Tepper from Carleton University. This is City News. Being a crossing guard works great as part of my schedule as a high school student because I still have time to do my tests and assignments while earning a little bit of cash on the side. It fits, working as a crossing guard fits into my current lifestyle because it gives me a lot of time during the day to pursue hobbies that I'm very interested in. A friend of mine introduced me to this job. Uh, I didn't know it was actually a, a paid job. I always start my day. It's a very little, I guess, few months, baby. And she always comes with her dad on a pram. And uh, the smile she has, like, oh my god. Well, I think the OSC is a, a very good employer. Uh, they, they show quite clearly that they care about you. They're very polite. They really make you feel like you're part of a family. It's fun. I really enjoy it. Gets us out of the house, too. Yeah. I'm Jason White. Right now in Ottawa, light rain, two degrees. It's three in Smith Falls. Here's what's making news this hour. A murder charge in this week's homicide at a South End townhouse. Ottawa police say 24-year-old Marie Gabriel was found beaten to death in a townhouse on Hetherington Road near Walkley and Albion Monday morning. Now, 40-year-old Jean Fenlin of Ottawa has been charged with one count of second-degree murder and is currently in police custody awaiting a court appearance. Ottawa sees a big jump in impaired driving charges back up to pre-pandemic levels. Police say 146 impaired driving charges have been laid in Ottawa since the start of the year, almost half the charges resulting from collisions. Some local medical officers of health are advising residents to continue wearing masks in public as high levels of COVID-19 continue trending upward. Medical officers in Peterborough and Durham region near Toronto recommend the masks stay on. Ottawa's top doctor, Vera Etches, says she's alerted to the province to the concerning levels of COVID-19 in the capital. Both Carlton and U Ottawa ending their COVID vaccine and masking requirements at the end of April. But the universities say the mask requirement could be put back into place depending on future COVID case trends. City News Time, 1133. I'm Jason White. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time for The World with Professor Elliot Tepper, Distinguished Senior Fellow, Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Good morning, Professor. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. Good morning, Rob. There was some hope this week that a breakthrough could happen on on peace talks or ceasefire talks, or perhaps that there would be a, a serious pullback by Russian troops. There were news reports to that effect. As we approach the end of another week, what is your assessment of the war in Ukraine? It's hard to say anything good about the war in Ukraine. There were peace talks, as you pointed out. Uh, the first face-to-face -face talks in a couple of weeks. The talks resumed. They were held in Turkey under uh, the president's personal auspices. The two sides met, uh, of course, uh, not, at the, not at the most senior level, but the negotiating, designated negotiators met. They did provide a, um, an interesting outcome. On the one hand, you could say that the 
Ukrainian government has had to concede that it is being pummeled. Uh, the country needs to be saved. So they put some concessions in writing on the table that the Russians had been asking for. On the other side, the Russians, if they wanted to, Rob, if they wanted to, now have an off-ramp because they could just, as an old saying uh, going back to Vietnam War, just declare victory and go home. Because what the Ukrainians have done has said, okay, we will not uh, ever join a military. We will become polit neutral, politically neutral, militarily neutral, meaning they will never join NATO. They've okay. accepted that. Okay. They will also... Professor? Have we lost the professor? Okay, David is going to uh, see if we can reconnect with Professor Tepper. He may have just hit the mute button on his phone, but uh, it's 11.35 here. Uh, some other things that we're going to talk about in addition to uh, the war in Ukraine as we make our way, hopefully, through the next 25 minutes with Perf um, Professor Elliot Tepper from Carleton University. Uh, the F-35s, Canada making the decision to buy the F-35s. The election in France. Uh, Macron was not popular as the leader of, of France, but who knows, maybe this war in Ukraine, his handling of the situation, maybe it has lifted his fortunes. Uh, there was some incredible reporting from Bob Woodward in the, in the Washington Post about the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, and one of the big revelations is there are no phone records for, for the f former president's um, day on January 6th and missing seven hours. I mean, I, they, they, used, they tried to get rid of Richard Nixon, you remember, during Watergate because there was 20 minutes of tape missing. How about seven hours? So those uh, are some of the other issues that we'll probably get into over the next uh, 25 minutes with the professor who we have back. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank uh, you, professor. Sorry we like lost you there. Radio. Ah, it <laughs> happens. Yeah, it happens. It's ha pandemic live radio, professor. So um, let's pick up where, where we left off d talking about off ramps, potential off ramps. Yes, the Russians have been offered one if they choose to take it, and it's highly unlikely they will. Uh, the major concessions have been made. On the other side, the Russians also have made a concession, uh, apparently. The uh, Russians used to talk about why we went in there. This is not the Russians. This is Mr. Putin, Mr. Putin himself. We are going in to denazify, de denazify, what a term, uh, Ukraine, meaning we're going to eliminate the government of Ukraine and we are going to demilitarize it. And major concessions have been made now on the second part. On the first part, the concession by the Russians is apparently and I uh, express a lot of doubt about everything I'm about to say. Apparently, the Russians have said, yes, we will no longer seek to remove the government of the day. We're not going to unleash, as has been reported uh, in the Times of London, assassination squads against, against Mr. Uh, uh, Zelensky and his family in the top tier. Hmm. So now we're going to focus on grinding down the military. So what seems to be going on now, and the Russians have announced this, they are going to pull away from attacking Kiev and another city to the north, just outside the zone they already control. We're going to shift our forces over. I got a kind of running theme today, realignment. We're going to realign our forces to essentially grind down where the bulk of the um, uh, Ukrainian army is, which is on the east near the Donbass. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to try to take territory in that area. Yeah, it was interesting speaking with a spokesperson from the Canadian U Ukrainian Congress yesterday, and I just uh, raised this idea of uh, the, the the Ukrainian government perhaps conceding the Donbass. That maybe that would be an off ramp for for the Ukrainian government uh, uh, for peace ruled out uh, immediately, at least from that particular person. But. Um, they, the Russians have been there, what, eight years already? Yeah, they've had a fourteen, right? They've had a presence there. So, what do you? What, 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 yeah. So, what do you? What do you think? What do you think is happening strategically about talks about that particular part of Ukraine? 
what the uh, official Ukrainian position was at these peace talks was that they would uh, indeed talk about those over a 15-year period, which gets kicked off, inaugurated by a summit between Zelensky and Putin himself to deal with this hardcore issue. But Ukraine says we will not trade people, land, or sovereignty uh, over any part of Ukraine. So the Ukrainians are saying we're not conceding that at all. The Russians, on the other hand, are saying, um, you know, this is ours, and we're there to really liberate, liberate the Russian speakers of Ukraine, Ukraine is a, a mistake of history anyway. It doesn't really exist. The Russian, however, speakers of the areas we're talking about, the areas where they're trying to connect a land corridor between the Donbass and down to Crimea, are saying, we're Russians, we're U- speakers, we're Ukrainians. We don't want to be liberated by you and in this fashion. Okay. According to the Biden administration, so we have to consider the source here, Russian President Vladimir Putin is being misled by advisors. Yes, men, sycophants who are too scared to tell him how badly the the war is going. How do you interpret such talk from the White House? Well, it's very interesting. I just want to close off our previous conversation. Ukraine has said, we'll give up on NATO. We want similar kinds of guarantees, however, from a number of countries, Poland, Israel, Turkey, Canada, among them, along with Russia, the U.S., Britain, Germany, and Italy. So there's a, the Ukrainian government has flagged Canada as a potential guarantor of the future. In terms of what's coming out of the White House on um, this plausible scenario that, and we've seen it on TV, where Mr. Putin really has cowed everybody, his, his most senior uh, defense people and his intelligence people, uh, the Achilles heel, as is being said, of all autocrats is they're not going to be told things they don't want to hear. And that, in turn, could have serious implications for their decisions. But it, speaking of the going forward, it could also affect, according to the same speculation, that uh, any negotiations at the table by Mr. Putin are going to be based on the false assumptions that things are going wonderfully uh-huh. because nobody will tell him. To the contrary, Rob. Right, right. Okay, okay. All right. As you mentioned, Turkey played host to these peace talks. Turkey is a member of the NATO alliance. Yes, right. So why Turkey? What? And that's a really good question. Turkey has the confidence, apparently, of both sides, and they are playing it well. That is, uh, Mr. Erdogan, President Erdogan, apparently has a good personal relationship with Mr. Putin, and that's important. And as you pointed out, Turkey is a member of NATO, having a good personal relationship, and they work very closely together in Syria, trying to untangle Turkey's foreign policy. It would take us an hour and need several days of research. But the, um, the Turks are playing that card well. And on the Ukrainian side, they've had good relations there. Uh, so they say that we are the ideal mediators here. And they put their se- themselves forward, and the Russians have accepted it, and so has Ukraine. So I think uh, they, along with Israel, along with France, have all put themselves forward. And Russia and Ukraine are willing to say, okay, we need a, we need a mediator. We need somebody we can talk to. It's always a question of... Uh, on the Russian side in particular, are they really negotiating in good faith at the table? Okay. You know, Roman Abramovich was always tabloid fodder in the UK before he ever rose to prominence because of this war in Ukraine because he was a Russian oligarch who bought a a well-known soccer club, Chelsea, Chelsea, right? Um, Putin loyalist, oligarch... um, was part of this delegation in Turkey, despite these reports that he had been poisoned and part of his skin was peeling off and this stuff. But um, what do you think Abramovich can contribute to these uh, well, negotiations. Going back to your first question, what do, what should we all make of what we're hearing from various sources, which is take everything you hear basically with a grain of salt. Okay. What we see in front of us is scarcely the full story. Understanding Roman Abramovich's relationship with Mr. Putin is the start of it. He apparently is one of the few oligarchs who actually has a good relationship on an ongoing basis with Mr. Putin. He's also, uh, he's by no means the most powerful 
of the oligarchs in terms of access to Putin or access to money. But he has, as you pointed out, is more colorful. He's better known. Uh, when sanctions were put on, Ukraine said, do not add this oligarch to your list of sanctions. And as you can see why now, they need him because he apparently can play the same kind of role that others are trying to play. Uh, Turkey's president, we just talked about having the ear of both sides, and both sides want him there at the table. In terms of these mysterious poisoning, um, this is fascinating. There's two theories on it. The one that came out immediately is there was no effort to kill, and it wasn't just him. It was uh, the other members of the Ukrainian negotiating team, Rob, came down with the same ailment. It was just a, a scare tactic saying, we're not trying to kill you, but we want you, you've got to know that we we can get at you. So uh, keep that in mind as you negotiate with us. As you know, Russia has a history in terms of poisoning opposition. Yes. Yes. So yes. the other theory is, and this has been put out, and again, grain of salt, I think, by U.S. US intelligence, saying, no, it was environmental. What they had wasn't poisoning at all. I'm not sure we'll ever find out the truth on it. Okay. But nevertheless, they're still at the table and still talking. Okay, when we come back, uh, the, the, the latest, we'll get the professor's take on the latest on the energy angle to the, the war in Ukraine. There's an announcement expected uh, at 1.30 this afternoon from the U.S. president announcing the uh, release more oil f from uh, the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Meantime, Germany declared an energy emergency this week. So we'll talk about that. Professor Elliot Tepper, our, our guest, will be right back. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Welcome to the Ottawa Civic Center as we get set for what could be an historical moment in 67's history. Muscle gets hammered by Bickle. Free shot deflected, scores! Brian Beckel makes it one nothing Ottawa. Brian Beckel, a future premier power forward in the league. The rookie, watch what he does. Big hit, then goes to the net and tips this one home off the stick. Whitmarsh with no chance on the deflection. Up through center, Shepard with Foy racing for the front. Nice move by Foy. Beautiful. Scores! Second effort, Matt Foy, 2 nothing Ottawa. It's the second effort for Matt Foy that gets his 60th goal, milestone goal of the year. He and Corey Locke now both in 60, the first two players of the season in the OHL to do it. And it's textbook Foy going to the net. And look at the second effort, a goal scorer's goal with his own rebound. And Ottawa takes a 2 nothing lead. Bickle in on Poulin, and he runs into Poulin, runs him right over center, and puts him, McAllis couldn't find the handle. Loose puck, never save, and finally whistled down. There's a penalty shot. There's a penalty shot for the 67s. Watch Big what happens here. Big hit, look at Bickle. That's wow, what a, he's having a great game, I tell you. Comes out in front, then there's the puck. All of a sudden, loose, it hits a skate. And right there on the top, the player kneeling over. We can't get that number. He's standing up right now. It's Chap. Showman. It's Showman. Showman. He's got the puck in his right hand. Number 22. And here we go, Albiani. Scores! 3 1 Ottawa. Long pass up to Rodney Ballman. He's got Dickinson. Here's Dickinson. Break scores! Lou Dickinson restores the two goal lead. How fitting could it be that the Ottawa native, Lou Dickinson, could very well seal the victory for Brian Kilray's 1,000th the ninth pass from Rodney Bauman, and the overage Dickinson makes no mistake going underneath the blocker above the goal pad. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just witnessed history. Brian
The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. This is part two of the world with Professor Elliot Tepper. Carleton University's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. I want to talk about Biden, the working class and energy because it's certainly a big part of of the news story. Uh, now, according to reports at 1.30 our time this afternoon, U.S. President Joe Biden will announce the release of up to one million barrels of oil a day from the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve, perhaps 180 million barrels in all. Meantime, you have Germany's government declared an, a, a, an, an energy emergency this week in preparation for a supply shock from Russia. Energy prices in Germany, some European countries have risen a thousand percent. Can you imagine if your natural gas bill went up a thousand percent? What do you think of the, some of the attempts by some Western countries to blunt the pain on the home front? of this war yes well let's remember the pain of that home front as we leave a formal discussion of ukraine and the war uh the the devastation the humanitarian side of this is just uh uh animating i think a major realignment around the world in terms of their view of russia and in terms of what needs to be done going forward we have to keep the humanitarian side front and center of our conversation even though we have to talk about these other issues so the realignment i think theme it comes into effect here the situation in terms of as you phrased it uh mr biden releasing these strategic reserves is to in fact be sure that on the home front on the home front there's not going to be in the short term the kind of pain at the pump which can get you know governments thrown out of power as the midterms approach and beyond that uh, the election coming up so for president helping people not feel the pain of this war is a legitimate concern of all governments so we can put it in kind of crass political terms yes he doesn't want to lose votes over inflation and running at a high rate and you know, the price at the pump is very visible to everybody and that's an immediate pain uh, it's also by the way a regressive tax uh, the taxes on gas but that's a, another story the um the, the, the move right now is to try to make up the shortfall from any diminution coming out of Russia mm. in terms of the United States. This would not apparently do anything for the total global supply. It's a too small an amount, but it might make a difference at home. Yeah. Energy realignment, then. Certainly yeah. that's the with what's happening with Germany longer term, right? They have to realign <laughs> their energy supply. Yes. Uh, we are, I think, into a long-term now fundamental realignment of, of uh, energy supply, which will outlast whatever happens next with the Ukraine and Russian war. The, um, there's a lot of detail coming out. There's just were some more changes this morning. And all, <laughs> Robert affects the ruble. Mr. Putin yep, has, said, yep, yep. <laughs> has said, well, we should give some of the basics. Russia... Uh, Russian supplies something like 44% of Europe's gas supplies and 80% of Austria's. So this is not a light matter uh, going forward. But Mr. Putin has said, okay, from now on, we are not going to, because of these sanctions, be able to deal with you. We don't want you to deal any longer with those currencies under sanction. That's the U.S. what affects us, U.S. dollar and, and uh, a little less to the EU. So from now on, we are going to only accept rubles. So the Germans said, hey, we've got a signed contract here. And everybody else, we've got signed contracts. Uh, but what we will do is get around it. We'll go to a bank that's not being sanctioned that will basically translate our hard currencies into rubles. And the collapsing ruble then will get the support you're after, yeah, Mr. Putin. Yeah, yeah. And this morning, Mr. Putin gave a long talk. I watched a lot of it. And Mr. Putin said, no, nope, that's not going to work. As of tomorrow, Rob, as of tomorrow, I will only accept payment in rubles and no workarounds. So this is now causing some panic. Uh, Mr. Schultz of, of Germany said, we have a signed contract. We're going to keep paying the way we said we're going to pay. Mr. Putin has said, we're not going to accept that. So we, we might have an immediate crisis. But the longer term, I, mean, I should say, right now, the shorter term phenomenon is that Europe is really pulling together on a realignment of their energy sources. 
Norway is going to pump up uh, a lot more. They, they can produce more. The countries of the, starting with Germany, are all of Europe are working together, Robbed, in order to deal with the impending emergency. They're going to send supplies to each other. So this is almost a, a rejuvenation of the concept of Europe. I was calling it earlier with you, the new Europe. So we're seeing a realignment of energy policy over the long term in, in the new Europe as a result of this crisis. Okay, well, why don't we just stick in Europe for a second here? Because the election in France is going to, you know, it's a, it's, it's a weird the way they do it, and I don't completely understand it, but I was reading today the whole thing lasts 24 days or so. <laughs> uh, so it'll be much of the month of April. Macron was not terribly popular. Uh, I, I'm wondering if, you know, if realignment is our theme, um, w- w- will Macron be a, a victim of realignment in the month of April? What do you think? It could uh, be apparently the beneficiary of the realignment because okay. a lot of the a lot of realignment in Europe was being undertaken earlier, earlier by the Russians and a lot of help from Mr. Bannon. They were going to realign all the parties of Europe into a, a, a massive right wing movement, a populist right wing ethno nationalist movement, which would undercut the democracies and therefore the EU itself and, and so forth. But a lot of those parties, including Marine Le Pen's party, she's changed the name, but it's the National Front Party, took money from Mr. Putin when. Those times look good for them. They were on the march. They were on the roll. The current realignment is if you're cozying up to right-wing dictators and um, taking their money, you're probably going to pay a political cost, and that seems to be what's happening now. Uh, Mr. Putin is is up. He's almost at 30 percent right now. Uh, Marine Le Pen is at 18.5. I'm just reading this morning's uh, um, polling and uh, there's another right wing figure two other right wing figures who are splitting the vote hmm. so Mr. Macron looks like he's gaining on them there's a new force there Eric uh, Zenmore coming up but he's dropped to 11% there's a force on the uh, traditional socialist side that's starting to show some muscle but right now it does look as if after the um, after the fatal attempt a mistaken attempt to realign Europe along the Russian, Bannon, ethno-nationalist, uh, right-wing populist. There's now a pushback saying, no, democracy matters, and those who stand up to democracy and against Mr. Putin are going to benefit at the polls. Interesting. All right. That is our time for this week. It flies by. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome, Where we are next week again. Yeah, Professor Elliot Tepper, Distinguished Senior Fellow, Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Be back tomorrow after the 9 o'clock news. Friday free for all tomorrow during the Talkback Hour. Sam LaPrade comes your way right after our noon news update here on City News. The Rob Snow Show. Weekdays at 9 on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 a.m. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. is brought to you by NHL.